welfare organized by IQSC Vijay Krishna Girls College Howrah in collaboration with West Bengal Board of Biodiversity. Now, without wasting much time, may I now request our Honorable Principal Madam, Dr. Ruma Bhattacharya, to inaugurate the session with her valuable speech. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Devlina. Um, uh, I am uh, I'm really, really sorry uh, because of the delay. I never had this technical glitch before. We have been doing so many webinars. But uh, however, some, something uh, happened today and uh, it was beyond my control. Finally, with the he with help of uh, Dr. Amit Mojumdar, I could get through uh, 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 into this uh, web line. Uh, we are all dependent on so many things. Good afternoon and good morning uh, to all those who have joined this web uh, multidisciplinary international webinar on uh, biodiversity and sustainable development in human welfare. Under this uh, pandemic situation uh, uh, with um, lockdown, work from home, and uh, set up new uh, normal rules, we are, uh, being, we are being exposed to quite a few things that I would say we were not so proficient in before. And under these conditions, uh, something uh, that has become a popular academic parlance is webinar. Uh, and this um, technology, technology today uh, held up, uh, held me up for uh, almost more than half an hour, but then this technology has uh, given us an opportunity to come together uh, on a platform uh, which uh, which is uh, kind of uh, uh, which allows us to interact without going into physical proximity of a gathering in a auditorium uh, for a seminar as we all used to do before this uh, pandemic and, and before before and before this physical proximity was forcefully voted out by this invisible enemy that we are uh, facing every day. Uh, having said that, in this backdrop, I would like to say that um, this webinar, uh, just like the other webinars we have been organizing under different disciplines, have, we ha in this process we have been trying to um, uh, build up an awareness or build up a thought process in, through which we could uh, see for, well, do something uh, in this very unusual circumstances, look forward to something uh, under these circumstances. And today's, the two, this, this two-day webinar uh, will definitely be a, a very important um, academic endeavor um, in which uh, about all, five to six departments, disciplines are involved and we will be listening to many erudite speakers uh, in, in different aspects of uh, human welfare from different uh, sides of it. In this connection, uh, also, also, I would like to point out here that since an, any academic uh, uh, endeavor is incomplete, until and unless we involve our students. And uh, so far, Bijay Krishna Girls College has always, always tried to uh, rope in the students in any possible way that uh, it could. And here also we are giving our students, including undergraduate students, uh, to uh, write a paper and present a paper, which I believe will be a, a way of method of learning, a process of learning for them, uh, for their career. Uh, and we are going to we are going to have presentations of some selected papers in uh, some uh, future day. Uh, uh, having said having said all this, having said all this, I would like to now welcome uh, our uh, uh, participants, our panelists, our speakers. But first of all, I must welcome Dr. Shannal, uh, Chairman, West Bengal Biodiversity Board. His uh, support, immense support, has uh, and collaboration has made this webinar possible. Uh, uh, Dr. Shannal, I welcome you. Thank and, you, ma'am. Uh, 
ओके नमस्कार आई वुड ऑल्सो लाइक टू टेक दिस ऑपरचुनिटी टू वेलकम डॉक्टर बारबरा स्मिथ एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर सेंटर फॉर आर्कियोलॉजी वॉटर एंड रेजिलियंस कन्वेंट्री कोवेंट्री यूनिवर्सिटी यू के Ma'am, I hope you are here. It's I think it's quite uh, early in the morning um, uh, for you. Uh, I hope you are here. You are very much welcome to our uh, uh, webinar, and we are waiting to listen to your aspect of biodiversity and human welfare. We have. I would also like to welcome Dr. Konika Chatterjee, Professor, Department of Commerce, University of Calcutta. Professor Chatterjee and Vijay Krishna Girls College has had a long association, ma'am. We have uh, you have been with us in other seminars, uh, so I welcome you once again on behalf of our family. We have with us Dr. Pratap Kumar Fadi, uh, Professor, Department of Environmental Studies, Shikha Bhavan, Vishwa Bharati University, sir. Uh, we okay. are very much. we are very much eager to listen to your aspect uh, of what is happening around us and what should be done under these circumstances then uh, this uh, uh, for tomorrow for tomorrow we have dr ajit abu rai choudhury professor department of economics jadavpur university i have been fortunate enough to be a student of professor rai choudhury we i was in the in his first batch of students and we have a long association he is one of the most uh, i would say uh, popular famous teacher he's a, he's a, he's the best teacher that i have had in my life and he is a very established and renowned person in our discipline uh, i welcome professor rai choudhury uh, i also welcome dr monomita nondi reader accounting and finance director of internationalization and interna international exchange <coughs> coordinator Brunel uh, Business School, Brunel University, London. Ma'am, you have been with us in our economics webinar. I once again welcome you, and we are very willing to listen to you to, on uh, your your aspect on today's topic. And she will be accompanied with the, her research scholars, uh, Miss Lee Roberts and Miss Jaskaran Kaur. and i welcome them to they are, we we would we would like very much uh, an interaction with our students research scholars we are very interested in that and finally i would like to take this opportunity to welcome dr professor parthib bashu of calcutta university for his generous support and for helping us to organize this webinar so uh, as it is we are already running a bit late so i would uh, once again welcome all of you my all the speakers distinguished speakers and all the participants to this two day webinar and hope you all make this webinar a great success thank you thank you madam thank you very much you are always our inspiration may i now request dr sheta goh our vibrant IQSC coordinator to welcome our guests and participants over to you Shita ji thank you devlina uh, on behalf of IQSC uh, first of all my sincere apologies to all participants and speakers for uh, being delay today for the first time uh, in this session uh, anyway i cordially welcome all our eminent speakers participants students delegates and uh, external members of iqsc and all members of our college governing body to today's international webinar on biodiversity and sustainable development in human welfare it is true that significant progress has been made in term of human development but this progress has come at the cost of uh, uh, at the cost of uh, biodiversity that supports Uh, millions of human lives so being aware of this uh, uh, danger we have organized today's webinar in collaboration with west bengal biodiversity board uh, my sincere uh, gratitude to dr ak shanal for his constant support and cooperation and we are also thankful to 
Dr. Parthiva Vasu, Professor, uh, Department of Zoology, University of Calcutta, and Director of Ecology Research Unit and Center for Agroecology and Pollination Studies for his assistance. <clears throat> thank you everybody for being with us today. And thank you and all the best to all of you. Thank you, Devlina. Thank you, Dr. Sheta Guho. Now this is an end of the inaugural session and we will move forward to today's technical session. Before we start, it is a humble request to all our participants, please do not send any greetings or introduction in the chat box. Otherwise, it will be really difficult for us to select and send your queries to our respective speakers related to their speech. Also, it is for your information that feedback form will be given tomorrow, nearly at the end of the session. So please do not get anxious for it from right now at this moment. May I now request Protap Mondol, Assistant Professor, Department of Mathematics, to introduce our first speaker of today. Over to you, Pratap. Thank you, Devulina. Now, welcome to our first technical session. In this session, our speaker is Professor Pratap Kumar Padi, and he delivered his lecture on role of biodiversity in human welfare and its sustainability aspect. Professor Padi at present is a professor of Department of Environmental Studies, Sikha Bhavan at Vishwavad University, India. Professor Padi achieved a star academic career from his student life. He completed his MPhil and PhD from JNU New Delhi and postdoc fellow in a project funded by Imperial College, London at JNU. He was awarded the President of India Medal for General Proficiency at GNU. He has more than 40 years of teaching experience and about 20 years of research experience. His research interest is on the air pollution and health, air pollution and plants, and pollution biology. He has more than 40 famous publications in national and international peer-reviewed journals in the field of environment. Under his mentorship, four scholars awarded their PhD and six more working at present. So I would like to welcome Professor Puttap Kumar Padi. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, 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 just uh, some clarification. Uh, this uh, teaching experience is not 40 years, uh, it's about 30 years. And uh, I have uh, 12 PhD which have come out and uh, six more are working. So these uh, yeah. two things I just wanted to correct it. Oh, I yeah. copy from the uh, website actually, sir. Yeah, yeah, that is, that is not updated over one. So I'm sorry, uh, that is also yeah. our fault. So it's not 40 years, it's uh, about 30 years. Okay, sir, thank you, sir. Continue, sir, please. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, without wasting any time, uh, we should continue because uh, we are already late. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to this important uh, international webinar. And in this occasion, I am going to present a paper on role of biodiversity in human welfare and its sustainability aspects. So in this paper, in this presentation, I am going to yes. So in this uh, presentation, I'll just briefly go to the what exactly biodiversity means because biodiversity is, is uh, for non non biological students. Uh, we should uh, have a little bit information on that. And then how, what role this biodiversity is playing for our well-being, and then what role we are playing for destroying as well as conserving them, and how can we maintain these resources sustainably? So that is the basic things which I am going to cover. 
so first of all what is biodiversity biodiversity as you know it's uh, all um, forms of life present on this planet earth starting from uh, say microscopic organisms bacteria virus up to higher plants and animals so this term bio biological diversity was first coined in the year 1980 sir by norts and macmanus and which was subsequently shortened to biodiversity in the year 1985 and by yes, wg sir sir sorry so, to disturb you sir yeah dr padri sir sir okay. can you please yes. uh, can you can you please run this uh, your ppt in the slide show slide show is it okay now yeah yeah, yeah. thank you sir yes, yes sir thank you sir oh sorry <laughs> okay no problem sir no problem. so uh, actually on the other occasion i i could not share my screen that's why i sent the presentation to sukhamba to share with you people so but anyway this this time it is working it's fine so no problem so this uh, term biological diversity or biodiversity both are same although coined in two different times in 1980 and 1985 so what exactly or what what are the composition of biological diversity uh, as we all know uh, for biology students we, we used to know but for non biology students we have uh, ecosystem diversity we have species diversity and we have genetic diversity and agro biodiversity as uh, professor anil was telling agro biodiversity is uh, gaining very important um, uh, attention nowadays because of new species are formed by the scientists uh, every day we are producing new uh, species of plants and animals and that's why this agro diversity is uh, gaining importance so coming to the ecological diversity one ecosystem is uh, different than other ecosystem in the uh, in terms of its uh, biological composition or species compositions so that is ecosystem diversity that is forest ecosystem is different than say desert ecosystem for example so one ecosystem is different so that diversity in uh, uh, in between the ecosystem is called ecological diversity now coming to the species now in each ecosystem we have different number of species or different types of species so that is species diversity so you have different species say so far in um, uh, on this earth we have identified and cataloged say about 2 million of species although the estimate shows that about uh, 1 trillion of species are there in this nature so we know very few i mean very little information about uh, this biological diversity and then within each species we have genetic diversity so now coming to this welfare what all role is played by the biological diversity or this by resources so this biological diversity is actually forms a life support system for us i mean for human being so this is the biological i mean biotic part and plants and animals and the other life support system is the abiotic part that is atmosphere uh, hydrosphere and lithosphere so we are not we are concerning here about the uh, biotic part that is biological diversity so man depends on this natural ecosystem for essential ecosystem ecological services like maintaining atmosphere that is both production of oxygen as well as sink of carbon dioxide is takes uh, takes place uh, in this uh, uh, biological system particularly plants they regulate our weather patterns and pollinates our crops cycling of nutrients soil fertility water cycle so lot many things now coming to food clothing housing energy so energy i i would like to uh, stress here in subsequent slides uh, we have to move to this renewable resources of energy in future because of the non renewable resources or exhaustible resources the fossil fuels for example are creating problems for us and and also they are exhaustible they are going to be exhausted some days so we need to find out the alternatives so to make a sustainable energy base for our uh, for human being so this is going to play very important role here also medicines and other important usefulness 
so to give some figure about uh, around 1.6 billion people depends on forest for their livelihood including 70 million indigenous people now forests are home to more than 80% of all terrestrial species of animals and plants and insects coming to the aquatic part fish provide 20% of animal protein to about 3 billion people only 10 species provide about 30% of uh, captured fishes and 10 species provide about 50% of aquaculture production now about 1 lakh species of insects as well as birds and mammals pollinate more than two thirds of food plants i mean if they are not there then there would not have been any food i mean pollination there without pollination there is no grain production so so we would not have got any food materials or grains or any other uh, food materials from the biotic resources so they are very very important as far as pollination is concerned so over 80% of human diet is provided by plants of the three cereal crops rice maize and wheat provide 60% of energy intake globally so microorganisms and invertebrates they are key to ecosystem services because they are the one which used to uh, uh, help us in nutrient cycling and uh, they used to release the materials uh, after degradation and then the materials comes to the atmosphere or hydrosphere and then cycling of nutrients micro as well as macro nutrients of course because of the presence of microorganisms so they are also very important constituents of biotic system but unfortunately they are not uh, i mean uh, they are poorly known and rarely acknowledged now coming next as many as 80% of people living in rural areas in developing countries rely on traditional plant based medicines and healthcare according to the estimate by the who but many modern prescription drugs are also derived from substances found in plants animals and fungi that means we used to take some biological organisms or part of the organisms for our medicinal purposes and also we take some uh, metabolites or use some biochemical models or templates for synthetic compound productions which are used for medicinal purposes for example the alkaloids that cure the cancers hodgkins lymphoma and acute childhood leukemia are derived from this a plant from madagascar indigenous to madagascar so there is another drug that made organ transplant viable cyclosporine cyclosporine helped us in organ transplants so that has come from a soil fungus fungi fungi are some microscopic organisms uh, that is um, we can say that they are uh, the decomposers uh, in association with bacteria they help us in uh, nutrient cycling as well as other purposes so this fungi has gave us uh, this compound cyclosporin which made us uh, this uh, uh, organ transplant possible the marine sponges are rich in resources of anti cancer chemicals okay so there are a lot of chemicals are derived from these marine sponges which are used as tumor suppressants and have been proved to be very good for treatment of cancer now coming for to some uh, economical aspects we are not we cannot assess uh, the economic benefits of the living resources to give a few example here we can say that how much uh, contribution in terms of money is provided by this biodiversity ecotourism for example generates significant employment and is now uh, say around us dollar 100 billion per year uh it has been estimated that this much is uh we are able to get from ecotourism uh, due to <clears throat> involvement of manpower in this so many tourism business are purely or partially on biodiversity or ecosystem services now for example watching along 
this whale watching alone estimated to generate us dollar 2.1 billion in 2008 with over 13 million people undertaking the activity in 119 countries now another estimates insect under the, the one which i have already told that pollination so the insects and uh, other animals which helps us in uh, pollinating plants so that we can produce grains is estimated to about us dollar 200 billion so huge i mean these are few estimates the other ecosystem services which we get is not easily assessed there are some estimate which are beyond of this presentation but and so much i mean lot of many uh, helpfulness or what do you call welfare activities from the biodiversity now coming to the other aspects what have you done to these resources which has which has made this human being uh, or the life support system possible for human being what we have done in return and some activities which are detrimental which are uh, uh, harmful uh, for these resources which i am going to stress here the human activities has altered almost 75% of the earth's surface squeezing wildlife and nature into an ever smaller corner of the planet that means one species that is human being if you consider the total uh, living system say out of this say 2 million uh, cataloged or identified or say in nature as i mentioned 10 to 80 million some estimates say 1 trillion so that out of that number of species we one species that is human being is created problem for the other uh, biotic species as we continue to encroach on fragile ecosystem the humans into ever greater contact with wildlife for example in recent days we are uh, facing the problems of covid 19 and covid 19 as you all know has come from this wild animals okay bats and then pangolins and uh, a lot many report says that uh, this virus has come to us because of our closeness to this wild animals or wild organisms and then from that the virus the carrier virus covid virus has come to us and has created havoc and is creating havoc in our planet earth and almost all countries are affected by this disease so around 1 million animal and plant species are threatened with extinction and many with within decades so lot many extinction long i mean there are different terms i am not going into details of that what is extinct what is uh, endangered what is rare there are different terminologies to Uh, describe the status of <coughs> animal or plant species on this planet so <coughs> between 2010 and 15 the world lost 3.3 million hectares of forest areas now illicit poaching poaching and trafficking of wildlife continues for 700 7000 species of animals products of animals and plants <coughs> in illegal trades that is i mean beyond the rule of the law the rule of the nation or <clears throat> land <clears throat> of the 8300 animal breeds known 8% are extinct and by and um, 20% are at risk of extinction now moving to the next aspects how can we use this biotic resources sustainably now there are various steps taken at international level which i am going to discuss after some time but before that we can use these resources with enhanced and maximal ways for our benefits or for getting the maximum outcome or benefit of the resources now degrade degradable solid and liquid waste that is part of the living system plants we can use the weeds for example the leaf litters for example the liquid waste or solid waste for example <coughs> kitchen waste we can use this waste or parts of the living system for biogas production now biogas is a good <coughs> energy source but also clean energy source it can 
come from all these waste products as well as weeds so you can use anything anything degradable you can use it for year and then you can produce biogas with a clean fuel and it has been estimated if this resource is exploited properly in india we can meet 40% of our total energy demand it has been estimated by some studies now second using various waste containing sugary materials we can produce alcohols and then alcohols can be used for uh, blended it can be blended with alcohol uh, sorry uh, with uh, gasoline to produce gasohol now brazil whole brazil is run by gasohol gasohol is nothing but say about uh, um, 75 to uh, uh, 70 70 to 75% of uh, gasoline and 20 to 25% of 30% of alcohol that means we are replacing this degradable uh, sorry this exhaustible resources with the renewable resources and then the demand for this exhaustible resource will decrease and then we will move towards sustainable energy base now <clears throat> the next one one can also go for wood based thermal power instead of coal based thermal power now the benefit of wood based thermal power is it's a renewable resource base we can take the help of wood we can plant those high energy and fast growing plant species tree species and then use that wood for uh, converting the wood into different um, uh, combustible gases which is by a process called gasification and then we get hydrogen and methane that can be burned to run your turbine to get thermal power so that way we can replace this uh, exhaustible with sustainable energy resource based that is based on the biodiversity the next is one can use the lower group of plants algae for example there are very microscopic organisms basically live in plant, uh, i mean aquatic system where we can there are lot many research are going on and also found out that lot many algae can be used for producing <coughs> biohydrogen biohydrogen and hydrogen as you know is a clean clean fuel uh, you can exploit that and then also hydrocarbon so lot many algae are nothing but uh, 80 to 90% of their body biomass is nothing but hydrocarbon so you can exploit that to meet the energy demand now how can we use this party research sustainably <clears throat> about <clears throat> in addition as renewable resources increasing replace to fossil fuels forest will become more and more important as already mentioned that we will be going to this resources for energy needs for energy demand to fulfill our energy demand and at present 40% of the global renewable energy is come from this wood fuel which is equal to or equivalent to the solar hydro and wind power combined now coming to the <coughs> uh, final aspects that is what role internationally has been played to uh, manage these resources sustainably this there is a mission called un sustainable development goal uh, formulated by general assembly in the year 2015 and there are 17 goals on this uh, this goal number 15 depends on or this deals on this biological diversity including your sustainable managed forest combat desertification halt and reverse land degradation and halt biodiversity loss now there are the uh, various targets set for this achieving this sustainable developments and there are also some achievements in this now the targets fast by 2020 ensure the conservation and restoration of a sustainable use of terrestrial and inland freshwater ecosystems and their services in particular forest wetlands mountains and dry lands in line with obligation under international agreements so by 2020 it has been agreed in this goal number 15 that one has to take conservation and restoration measure for these biological resources to make it make it sustainable the second targets was by 2020 promotes the implementation of sustainable management of all types of forest halt deforestation restore degraded forest and sustainably 
increase afforestation and restoration globally the next is take urgent and significant action to reduce the degradation of natural habitats halt the loss of biodiversity and by 2020 protect and prevent the extinction of threatened species next promote fair and equitable share of the benefits arising from the utilization of genetic resources and promote appropriate access to such resources as international agreed i mean we following the norms following the guidelines we have to use this now take urgent action to end poaching and trafficking trafficking of protected species of flora and fauna flora is nothing but the list of plant species at a particular place at a particular time fauna is list of animal species and address both demand and supply of illegal wildlife products now by 2020 integrate ecosystem and biodiversity values in international and national local planning development process uh, <clears throat> proved to reduce strategies and accounts mobilize and significantly increase financial resources from sources to conserve the and conserve and sustainably use biodiversity and ecosystem so you have to maintain not only the biodiversity as well as the ecosystem so ecosystem management has to be there because ecosystem used to support the biodiversity there are different ecosystems as mentioned already so we have to maintain the ecosystems so one once we maintain the ecosystem automatically the inhabitants of that mobilize significant resources from all sources and all levels to finance sustainable forest management and provide adequate incentives to developing countries to advance sustainable management including for conservation and deforestation the next enhance global support for effort to combat poaching and illegal trafficking of protected species including increasing uh, capacity and local communities to pursue sustainable livelihood opportunities and finally the goal set targets for the sustainable management of this forest and reduction of deforestation and forest degradation and uh, developed as part of the forest community response to 2030 agenda for sustainable development that means by 2030 we have to achieve the targets set up in the 2015 un sustainable development goals and to provide the un's overall blueprint for economic progress that protects the environment and the welfare of humanity or human welfare so these are all references and thank you so if there is any worries i may thank you professor padi it was a excellent presentation and lecture with full of essential information to our participant dr padi there are some question from our viewers in the chat box but for the shortage of time we we select some of them i place one by one sir and dr polvi adhikari mukherjee uh, question was the contribution of ayurvedic medicine against covid 19 hello sir yes hello yes, uh, yes. sir there is a question from yes. dr polvi adhikari mukherjee yes the contribution of ayurvedic medicine against covid 19 Yeah, yeah. I mean, a uh, lot of uh, things are there. I mean, uh, whatever medicinal uh, values we used to take from the living resources, starting from, say, what do you call Artha Shastra books, we follow from uh, Kautilya Artha Shastra till today. The Ayush Ministry is dealing with all this. Uh, I mean, a lot of uh, uh, plants, uh, plant metabolites, or uh, products are, uh, are usually. produce uh, to improve the immunity of the system and uh, uh, recently as you all you know that uh, there is a claim from baba ramdev of uh, this uh, patanjali they have claimed that they have uh, uh, produced something but 
unfortunately due to some uh, uh, what do you call uh, improper uh, i mean uh, guidelines or whatever uh, they, they didn't take the proper uh, um, uh, permit or whatever they they could not able to uh, say that this is uh, a covid 19 uh, vaccine or that kind of things or medicines but they can they, they 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 are saying that this is a good medicine for boosting your immunity so once your immunity is boosted i mean it's uh, not easy for the virus to uh, survive in your body that's what sir another question from swayam siddha sharma we use biological resources for living and in this process destroying it how biodiversity and habitat loss affect our economy how it is affecting our economy huh. yes i mean <laughs> economy will be affected as you know that uh, we, i have shown many things but we never calculate the economy of uh, the ecosystem services uh, provided by the living system for us now uh the other day i was reading that uh, in uh, italy one patient was charged with say 6000 or some euro uh, for getting ventilator for one day and he was crying and then telling that i can pay this but for the last 70 years i was using this oxygen from the nature without paying anything so i am using this ventilator for one day i am and i am i, I was asked to pay for 6000 euro so you we, we never uh, i mean uh, calculate that way so once we ca calculate and once we take proper care to regenerate and reproduce that resources then we can go sustainably along with our biotic resources without without biotic resources we cannot survive and we can we can uh, fulfill our things with the help of these biotic resources a proper taking care a taking proper care sir another question from samol kanti mulli how will estimate the status of biodiversity area estimate the status of biodiversity area in an area ha uh -huh. yes sir Uh, actually, uh, uh, Dr. Sandhyal is there, so he'll be uh, talking tomorrow, and he is uh, he is involved in this uh, biodiversity assessment. I mean, uh, lots of taxonomists are involved in identifying the plants and animal species of a region, and then cataloging it. If that is a new one that is identified as a new species, they used to add to the uh, list, and if it is found that 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 a species was there in the list previously but is not found at present then that is deleted from the list so i mean uh, it's basically the biologists are involved in particularly the taxonomists they are involved in identifying the plants and animal species of a region thank you sir thank you sir again for your beautiful lecture thank you so much mm now i invite dr amir mojundar assistant professor department of commerce to introduce our next speaker uh thank you pratap sir uh, may i request party sir to uh, stop sharing uh, his screen sir hello party sir yeah thank you so much sir uh, this is uh, i am feeling uh, really privileged and fortunate enough to welcome my madam my teacher whom i have learned so many things for the last 20 years my teacher dr konika chatterji she is the professor of department of commerce university of calcutta she used to uh, taught the topic like business ethics corporate social responsibility strategic management international business this is my specialization and whenever the uh, the, the the thought of this kind of a webinar comes to our mind 
regarding the biodiversity and sustainability, I think uh, MAM is the best person to guide us in this particular. You know, we are eager to uh, listen from my MAM, my teacher. Uh, Madam uh, was the head of the Department of Commerce, University of Calcutta, and also uh, the associate editor of uh, peer review departmental journal of our Department of Commerce Business Studies. Uh, she was uh, director of IQAC University of Calcutta and also the university nodal, uh, nodal officer of All India, sorry for higher education, all we know, AISHE, how important it is for the MHRD. She had successfully uh, guided all the affiliated colleges uh, to conduct the AISHE program. I'm also part of that thing. I'm really thankful to ma'am for guiding us. Uh, and Madam, I had, uh, as we have once already mentioned, Madam, uh, what would, uh, my research interest uh, a lot, especially in the corporate ethics, sustainability management, reporting, sustainability finance, banking, ethics in financial market, sustainability literacy, and the ethics in academic research. But I've had a lot of good papers on that, uh, uh, the research ethics and the plagiarism. We have attended a lot of seminars uh, where Madam had given a valuable uh, suggestions and actually guided us. And also uh, regarding the alignment of business education with uh, universal uh, Sustainable Development Goal of the UNO. Uh, Madam, uh, during her career, Madam uh, had already uh, uh, successfully guided eight research, uh, uh, research scholars in the PhD and the, uh, and then 13 MPhil students. And presently, four PhD students are doing research under her supervision. They are fortunate enough, and, and one MPhil student is also doing. One of the good things I want to share some uh, thoughts with uh, with, the, with, the, with the participants. Uh, and, uh, the thing is, the madam is the first lady of the University of Calcutta history. Uh, she got first class first in BCom honors. Uh, a really outstanding career, and also in the history of University of Calcutta Department of Commerce, uh, she is the first and only self-supervised PhD awardee. Uh, she had done her, her PhD on strategic environment management in the Indian uh, passenger car industry, and she, it is her own contribution and. Uh, uh, and nobody, no uh, person was in the supervisor position. Mana was the self supervisor, the first time in the history of Calcutta. She's the only person. So uh, we are we are really fortunate enough to have ma'am. And uh, ma'am also had a chance to visit Harvard Business School, Harvard University, uh, but to have an interaction with uh, Joseph uh, Madarakko, uh, the John Sheridan Professor of uh, Business Ethics of Harvard Business School in the year 2015. 15. So, Madam had represented our uh, University of Calcutta, and also Madam had represented our uh, our University uh, in the BRICS Nation uh, Summit. I know that Madam uh, had in Johannesburg. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, in the Johannesburg, Madam had mentioned that thing. So, uh, it was an outstanding career, outstanding guidance we got. It. We are fortunate enough to have Madam uh, as one of the person to guide us uh, in the when we go when we went for the uh, uh, our. Uh, our NAC accreditation process in cycle two, Madam was there to help us, to guide us. And in the cycle one, Professor Shulitri Banerjee was also there, my teacher, to guide us how to do it. And uh, immensely helpful uh, support we get from our Madam. And, uh, um, and especially uh, the Department of Commerce, we have, there is a, a center of Calcutta Stock Exchange uh, under, with, the, with, the, with the collaboration of Calcutta Stock Exchange is known as the known as CU, CSC, CF, uh, CEFM, that is the Calcutta University, University of Calcutta, Calcutta Stock Exchange of Center of Excellence in Financial Market. Madam, uh, uh, actually, for the, she, she was one of the founder member of that uh, particular uh, center, and where uh, uh, the, the students and the, from, uh, and the researchers used to have the ideas of the capital market development, financial inclusion, ethics in financial market. So, uh, we are all eager to learn from ma'am, uh, especially in the spiritual consciousness and the positive psychology of human uh, flourishing for the enhancing corporate integrity and the globally responsible business leadership. And how uh, uh, in, 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 in her lectures and the series, we are unfortunate enough to, you know, to, to attend a lot of programs in the, in the case studies where Professor Arup Chaudhary said used to conduct the, the, the programs where we have learned a lot uh, how to think uh, in the no, uh, in, in the non-conventional ways, with, uh, uh, and how to present the business uh, the business care work with the business education to our students, beloved students, in a, through the case study basis, the, the, the scenario analysis, and uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not taking too much time, Madam. Uh, the floor is yours. 
we are eager to listen from you guys. And uh, from the college days, university days, I am also eager to listen from you guys. Please, ma'am. Thank you so much, uh, Amit. Amit has been one of my very favorite students. And uh, I would uh, take thank this you, op opportunity to thank uh, uh, the principal, uh, the honorable principal of the college of Vijayakrishna Girls College, whom I have met so many times before. Uh, I hope I'm audible. You, you are very much audible. Okay. Uh, Professor Ruma Bhattacharya, I would also thank uh, the head of uh, the internal quality assurance cell of the college for uh, chipping in to make this seminar possible. Taking a cue from uh, the organizers, I decided to uh, share my views uh, on the quality of education. And since business education is... Uh, what I do uh, as a calling. I uh, was just trying to put down some thoughts as to how business education should respond and react to what is going on now. Uh, we're facing a pandemic, but uh, pandemics have occurred before. And more importantly, uh, what we cannot do anymore is consider and comfortably assume that things can go on the way they were going on before. Our lives have changed so fundamentally. Lifestyles have changed. And given these changes, uh, definitely it's just not an online platform that is going to change education. But I think the basic, the very fundamental assumptions on which education is going to be based needs to change. We have to remember that if we don't solve these problems now, somebody has to, because uh, we only have this one planet available to all of us, no matter which part of the world we are or which time zone we belong to or what our economic or social status is. And given this fact, uh, if we don't solve these problems, it will definitely fall upon the future generations to do something about these problems. Like we see now, uh, we cannot escape. These problems are inescapable and they come as unprecedented challenges. And when they do come, they defy the known solutions. In other words, what we hear a lot nowadays has become a cliche to talk about out of the box thinking. Out of the box is actually uh, in terms of challenging the assumptions on which we base our thinking. So here we are about to look at business education. Uh, one of the very attractive options for most young students uh, and one of the major ambitions that they have when they are young is to study MBA and to land a very cushy job. But uh, business education doesn't seem to serve the very important purposes uh, in terms of the challenges we're facing, but also in terms of protecting the quality of human interaction, uh, the quality of the natural environment, and particularly uh, the quality of human existence as such. So these were some of the uh, very teasing questions that seem to haunt me very, very often, even when I take class. And I wonder whether the hackneyed approach to uh, this, the compartmentalization in subjects and uh, having slots and assignments really serve any purpose because students are overburdened and they really don't take in much uh, with an aspiration to create positive change. So it is this particular issue that is uh, really uh, the bone of contention for me. Uh, Amit, will you please uh, open my presentation? Yeah, ma'am. Yeah, ma yes. 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 Okay, I have uh, uh, put the title of my presentation in terms of rethinking business education and rethinking business education, not in terms of how we understand the economy, not in terms of how we understand production, distribution, resource use, product use, because a lot of this has to do with uh, just grab things from nature use them 
in terms of the technologies available to us, in terms of the production systems available to us, all of which are geared towards profit making, and then distribute and have customers use products such that they degrade or decay fast enough for the next cycle of products to come. So everything is driven by the market and the market is driven by a very short term motive of making profits. And this is where the problem lies. Uh, all this that we know and we see in terms of business and I, I'm sure that non-business people tend to blame business for everything gone wrong but it's also important to understand that business is the most vital force today for creating responsible positive change. If you, if you look at business in terms of uh, the resources it commands, in terms of the organizing power that it has, and also in terms of the financial clout that it has, uh, there's a lot of power. Then in what way is this power being used or what way should it be used? Uh, we are already in the throes of uh, a public health calamity and business has realized that uh, during the lockdown period that everything, when there is disruption, business will also face disruption. So these are some of the conditions that uh, I have brought into the paper. And so I have challenged our notion of the economy because we have to think in terms of a nested concept of an economy being embedded in society and the society being embedded within habitats and the biosphere. So business is not autonomous and business cannot therefore assume linearity of, uh, 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 of the economic system. So which means that uh, waste disposal cannot be the end result of business processes. So this is my humble submission. And uh, will you please change the slide? Yes. Uh, my greatest inspiration for the study uh, is uh, none less than uh, Professor Albert Einstein, who has said that if we need to make a difference, it is a theory which decides what we can observe. So when I'm trying to look at an alternative way of conceiving economic systems, business enterprises, and the education that should shape business enterprises and business leaders, then we have to examine the theory on which business enterprises, business education, business enterprises, and the economic system are based. What is the foundation? So we start off this uh, discussion, deliberation with the wisdom of Professor Albert Einstein. Next, please. The rationale for this present study, uh, yes, uh, a skill that is demanded of every educator today is uh, going beyond uh, the surface, uh, engaging in critical reflection. A lot of uh, what we do as educators and researchers is to focus on analysis, analytical tools, evidence for backing or validating our analysis, so that we often complain that we don't have too much time for reflection. So uh, this forum uh, allows me to probably give the fruits of my critical reflection as to what business education ought to be. I'm not saying that business education has taken this shape, but in the next 10 years, maybe five to 10 years is the time we have. We don't have too much time. The earlier, the better. And why we need this redirection and then reshaping. Redirection first, because we have to change from linearity to circularity. And then the skill sets will also need to change in terms of what is demanded of a student and what is demanded of a student who later on offers her or his services to the business enterprise. So both these things have to change if they have to be meaningful for the future of a sustainable economy. Uh, of course, before us, we already have a compass 
the global sustainable development agenda is already before us since 2015 and they have set a 15 year target so it's agenda 2030 for us within which the quality of higher education is included as uh, one amongst 17 goals to be precise it is goal number four so it is only apt that such reflection takes place earlier rather than later so that we can make necessary change. Next, please. So what is my core argument? We often loosely talk about sustainability, about sustainable development. We have environmental studies papers. Uh, we try to uh, allot marks to students for engaging in uh, these papers, but mostly as I have seen, my experience shows that the students are really interested or spurred into any kind of sensitization from studying about the environment. So there must be a disconnect, as we say, between what is being studied, what is being assessed, the marks that they are getting, and what really happens to them in terms of learners and in terms of human beings. So which means that education doesn't translate into a more sensible or into a more sensitive human being. So this is what we need to start off. If systems have to be truly sustainable, then they have to function as regenerative rather than wasteful energy flow networks. So we have to move away from just thinking of how to manage waste or how to reduce waste to not creating waste at all. It almost seems inconceivable today because we're so used to a wasteful economy. We're so used to wasting just about everything. Uh, lately, I think it is about our hand washing regimen and the amount of water that we need. Uh, but again, we have to realize that water is scarce. Water availability is scarce. So, how do we really handle pandemics in future when water may not be available? So this, these are questions that we will raise when we think of moving away from handle pandemics in future. When yes. So when we're looking at a regenerative economy, we have to take a systems view rather than a fragmented uh, linear view of things. When we're looking at business enterprises, they have two sources of uh, inspiration. One is that scientific understanding itself is in a state of flux or evolution. We're moving away from the reductionist uh, paradigm to an ecocentric paradigm where everything is connected to everything else. And this kind of scientific thinking is actually born out in nature's processes. So nature's processes are essentially regenerative. Science is coming closer to understanding nature in terms of its regenerative life cycles. Business enterprises as powerful uh, forces that shape human lifestyles should therefore derive inspiration from both scientific understanding and nature's regenerative cycles. So what does that mean for us business educators? It's sad to say that uh, educators in general, because I, I fear this even more now, that we are, we are confined to our rooms and to these virtual spaces as far as uh, transmitting and exchange of ideas is concerned. Our classrooms were closed enough, but they were still physical spaces. So the fear is that we, we educators and particularly I'm talking about business educators and the learners are detached or what we call denatured, detached from nature. Since they are denatured, we suffer from a nature deficit disorder. Psychologists talk about attention deficit disorder, but we also suffer from a nature deficit disorder. We over intellectualize nature. We are concerned about DNA codes. We are concerned about studying uh, models about, uh, about uh, doing lab work. But what we don't do is really trying to 
enjoy or derive the joy of nature in terms of its symphonic beauty. So this is another plea I'm putting before uh, the August audience, and that is regenerative thinking would require us to move away or shun the reductionist paradigm of thinking in terms of subjects, uh, specializations, and rather to think more in terms of the challenges and the problems and see how interdisciplinarity could actually uh, serve to solve problems rather than have monodiscipline silos of various subjects and then trying each subject and each educator of each subject trying to prove his or her superiority of the, of the other. So a circularity mindset is of the essence. Next slide, please. Now, going back to uh, why business enterprises are what they are. If you look at our global economy, uh, international business strategy, all of these are geared towards understanding free market capitalism. The theories that uh, explain free market capitalism and free market capitalism again is couched on a linear model of, what do we say, take as much as you can from nature to the point of uh, exploitation or severe damage, then make, then use, sometimes half use, sometimes underuse, sometimes throw, and then waste, and then find how to dispose. If you think of all the plastics that we generated and how that is undermining the quality of ocean life, and even the solid waste that is being generated and how that is uh, creating a lot of damage to even our lives, uh, particularly during the rain, rainy seasons. If you're looking at this take, make, use, waste, dispose philosophy, it is archaic. It is far too old, more than 300 years old, but we still stick to it. The world has changed. The problems are changing. Contemporary realities do not, uh, deliver any sense to this uh, philosophy of the linear model, but we still stick on to. The result is that uh, education and business enterprises are visibly unsustainable. But despite the fact that they're unsustainable, practical people, and what I mean by practical people is people who are the acting people, people who act, people who are the doing people, Yes, when you're looking at managers, you're looking at uh, the people in politics, well, they will dismiss theory as being academic, inconsequential, something that doesn't have the power to guide practice. But we do understand that all this unsustainable business behavior has been at the root of the global scale crisis that we are facing today a lot of it. And if that is true, then we need to find a way out of this crisis. While we are harping on the fact that the crisis is there, we're trying to understand the impacts, but it's important to find what is the way out. And an important way out is to think differently. And like it said, uh, regeneration is the antithesis of crisis. And at least five years ago, when the sustainable development agenda came to be enforced in 2016, uh, this philosophy was espoused uh, in a very big way. And all our actions therefore need to be geared away from linearity towards regeneration, from waste creation towards restoration and regeneration. Next slide, please. Yes. Uh, well, I'm not uh, being very audacious uh, in criticizing business education. Uh, there are many detractors here. There are many people who are disillusioned uh, in terms of uh, understanding whether business education is relevant or irrelevant. And one such person who's held in high esteem by most management students and management teachers is none other than Professor Henry Mintzberg. In his book, Managers Not MBAs, 
he has made a case for talking about businesses requiring people who are sensible managers, whether they have MBA degrees to their credit or they do not have MBA degrees to their credit. And he says the major problem with an MBA, one of the major, uh, what would we say, inhibitors of having an MBA is arrogance. Uh, arrogance sometimes defines the MBA from the non-MBA. And to quote Minsberg, he says that B schools need to renew themselves first because they reveal visible signs of failing in their fundamental purpose to enhance the quality of leadership in society. Even though they attract high paying students who in turn have been getting high paying jobs. So it's just not high pay packets or the price tag of a course that can create relevance or that can create uh, uh, fame or that can create a sense of respect in society. What society needs, each one of us, is who will provide the necessary leadership. And like I already mentioned, business already is on a vantage ground in terms of the resources it commands, the talents it has, and the capacities, the potential capacities that it can harness through employment. So if this is a prerogative of business and business also has an uphill task and a big fundamental responsibility to renew and regenerate our economic system. Next, please. But why am I saying all this? Why are we talking about business having been, business education being unsustainable? Why do we need to move business education towards the threshold of responsibility? Well, it comes from the very plain and simple but uh, precautionary uh, caveat that we do not have a second planet. There is no planet B. There may be plan B, but not planet B. And so the one we have, we have to take special care of it. Uh, this is something that uh, was asserted by a very uh, famous business leader, uh, the CEO of uh, Virgin Airlines, Richard Branson. Now, we face a major, uh, what I would say, a dilemma. On the one hand, business education, as I said, is denatured, far removed from nature. Uh, syllabi, if you look at them, are more in the nature of introducing quantitative analysis. The quantitative analysis need to go by algorithms, a huge abstraction from nature. Even if there is nature talk, nature is seen more as an abstraction, an artifact, rather than something that exists in reality. So we don't need to open the windows and have a good look at nature or be actually, uh, what I would say, enmeshed in nature. So I've already mentioned that there is a question of nature deficit disorder. But on the other side, and this is the fearsome part, the future generation, even if we don't, the future generation of students have to respond to the burden of unprecedented sustainability challenges, like the one we are facing right now. And we have created problems, but somebody somewhere, and possibly the next generation has to be equipped to face these problems. Like it said, that you, know, you cannot solve a problem if you're imprisoned within the walls. So you've got to get out. Even Albert Einstein said that you can't start solving a problem from the point at which the problem really occurred. So this is where we need to think of change right away. Next, please. So what do we see as the threats? Uh, there are numerous threats, but I think the one that looms large in our minds today is number three, the pandemic. But the pandemic is not an isolated event. There have been events that have happened before. We have not taken too much heed of it. For instance, climate change. Climate change beyond a certain uh, threshold of the global average uh, surface temperature, which uh, we, we were warned by the IPCC of not having, not crossing. We were told to maintain it at one degree Celsius, but 
we have not been able to do that. So uh, global warming is bound to lead to pestilence of uh, one kind or the other and life forms that can thrive will do so. So these problems are actually related. So whether you're looking at climate change or at environmental quality deterioration or pandemics or public health system failures, uh, laws being flouted at will, terrorism, failures of existing institutional frameworks, they're all enmeshed, they're all linked. And it's very difficult to say which is the starting point. For us, of course, whatever is at hand, maybe the pandemic is making us think all of this, but all of these problems are so inextricably linked, we really cannot segregate them. But all of this is usually not caught within the statistical radar, or we call them statistical outliers. Uh, that's the basis of the black swan theory, which says that these statistical outliers of events that do not usually happen, they're very rare, they happen very rarely. For instance, we are talking about a pandemic of this scale having happened more than 100 years ago in 1918, 1919, and the world was so different then. So these high magnitude events are impossible to predict in terms of how they will unfold, but even more impossible to predict in terms of their outcomes. Despite that, despite their disproportionate role in human existence and human history, we tend to under-recognize them because we have certain psychological biases of things not going wrong in our part of the world or, in, or wherever we are. So we often have the psychological bias of things going wrong for others, but everything going right for myself or for one's own self. So I think this is, again, something that is very wrong with business education, which uh, promotes in a very big way the philosophy of individualism, of go-getting, of competition. So unless we change this whole mindset in terms of psychological biases, I don't think we'll only be tinkering with how problems get solved, but we'll not really get to the root of where the problem lies. Next slide, please. So what are the pathways that business can adopt? The easiest but the most foolish uh, would be business as usual. And I think nothing is going on as usual anymore. Our lives aren't. So if we were thinking of seminars, we would actually be busy for the last one month in planning a seminar and then uh, uh, converging in uh, an auditorium and doing the same. But we're not doing that. So business as usual is ruled out. As far as business is concerned, uh, we just cannot believe that everything is an over-exaggeration and that everything will return to normal. Nothing will return to normal. So business as usual is out. The next is business doesn't do anything, but simply waits for government or for civil society to do something and just stays on the sidelines as a bystander. While business did so by blaming the government or saying that the responsibility of business is just to make profits and everything else about uh, uh, social good, public uh, Im uh, improvements, environmental improvements was the role of the government, this doesn't work anymore. So business as bystander also will not really get the vote because business has to be very proactive in creating positive change. Number three is something the business is doing and business needs to do more and that is business as activist. That is wherever governments are failing, wherever other institutional frameworks, for instance, religion or education or family is failing, the business has to step in actively to understand what kind of change is required and then bring about that change. So business as activist. In fact, business as activist can be an important role in handholding with the government and establishing PPPs, that is, uh, people, uh, public, and private uh, collaborations. And then we have something that is uh, overstated, but not always uh, performed, and that is business as innovator. And here we're not just talking about technological innovations, but we are talking about innovations, even in little things as to how we will 
improve ourselves on a daily basis, how we can appreciate others, how we can think of creating positive emotions and positive change, even these are innovations. So this is also important. But predominantly here, we're talking about business as making sustainable innovations, innovations for improving of the environment, improving of social networks, improving of uh, the future of the planet. And finally, of course, if there is a possibility that three, four and five can be, three and four can be brought together, then business works as an integrator or as a business leader where it defines its role based on the problem at hand. So sometimes it works as an activist, sometimes it works as an innovator, sometimes for things already done well in, in the past, it all may also works as, as a bystander. So the role of business is not fixed. It is dynamic and depends upon what it wants to do to create positive impact. Next, please. Now, uh, we're already aware of the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 goals, and uh, most uh, organizations, large companies, multinationals are already trying their best to focus on these goals and to shape their performance based on these goals. Now, it's important to understand why these goals came up. While uh, it definitely is uh, uh, a follow-up of the failed, of its failed precursor in the Millennium Development Goals, but it's also important to understand that we are facing problems that are hugely complex. They're complex both in terms of the system, the embedded systems that are being affected, but also complex in terms of our behaviors. With social networking, we, are, we can express our opinions and there are so many ways to look at problems nowadays. And given that uh, both are increasing, system complexity and social complexity are increasing. So we cannot assume an environment where problems are tame. Tame problems are those where complexity, where both system and social are very low. So the kind of problems we're facing now are actually the badlands. They are socially complex because of our behavioral complexity, but uh, they're also systemic, systemically complex, which is why we're talking about circularity in the first place. And the sustainable development goals uh, have outlined 17 priorities for us. There could be many more, but these 17 priorities have actually been broken down into more than 300 targets. And uh, those targets try to capture somewhat uh, the complexity of the problems that we face and how interlinked these problems are. Next, please. So what is the takeaway for us, for us educators, for us researchers, for us teachers, for us co-learners? we have to move out of where we are. Our comfort zone is in transmission. And right now, I think even I'm engaged in transmission. So we have to move away from just being in transmission. That's where the word pedagogy come from, comes from anyway. That is, a teacher is superior, teacher is a know-all, and all knowledge has to be transmitted from the teacher to the students. And that way, the student does not develop an experience is overburdened, but doesn't develop an experience that will help uh, her or him to mature as a decision maker and to understand the challenges that one would face as a decision maker, as a mature decision maker. So we've got to move away from transmission and progressively move towards a generation that is have people uh, put their heads together and focus not on disciplines, monodisciplines, but focus the knowledge from disciplines. You see, most people have maybe 32 subjects or now our CVCS system has so many subjects, but these are all taught as watertight compartments. These subjects are not put together, integrated in order to drive them towards problem solving. And that is when students uh, uh, you know, get disillusioned, disinterested, and they cannot understand how that textbook knowledge can ultimately apply in their problem solving or even in their life challenges, in, 
in, in trying to imbibe life skills. If you see the, the rate of frustration, stress, suicides, uh, it's important therefore to move away from transmission to have a more generative, interactive uh, way to uh, shape teaching. And ultimately, this generative uh, approach should also give way to creating major transformations in the personality and the character of uh, the human learner. I'm not just talking about the student, I'm also talking about the teacher. Uh, because in most cases, I think even we are overburdened with our class loads and we can rarely focus within 40 minutes or maybe an hour to think in terms of creating positive transformation in our students. Uh, but uh, while this has not gone on before, we have to find ways and means to shift from transmission to transformation. Next, please. So when we're uh, moving towards uh, shaping education and a regenerative economy, uh, I've just given a pathway of where we are and where we need to be. Uh, we are still focused on reductionist thinking. Most of our research is extremely empirical and uh, analytical. And we tend to make certain assumptions uh, of linearity, particularly when we're doing business research. So uh, we really think in terms of closed loop uh, cycles. And this has in fact been uh, a major problem with the kind of waste that has been uh, generated by business, uh, whether we're looking in terms of greenhouse gases or solid waste or polluting oceans, uh, all of this uh, has been uh, you know, accepting this mechanistic reductionist design of the economy as sacrosanct and uh, shaping all our uh, business education on this. But we need to move away from this negative uh, value destruction mentality to a positive <clears throat> value creation mentality. And that is the case for moving away from degeneration onto sustainability and ultimately to regeneration. I just want to put in a word over here, the major difference between sustainability education and education for a regenerative economy is that sustainability education often just drives us to understand that the natural environment is important and that we need to care about uh, the various aspects of the natural environment, care about the problems out there, but uh, we don't uh, often think how business can create positive value by having uh, imbibed a different way of looking at things. So regeneration is more actionable than sustainable education. So this, uh, therefore, if you see sustainable moves on to restorative and then to regenerative education. Next slide, please. So regenerative thinking stands on certain principles, which we will find to be very, uh, which we will, Okay, which we will find to be very different from the kind of uh, principles that business espouses today. For instance, appropriate scale. Uh, most businesses are maximizing enterprises and it's often said that big is beautiful, uh, but we're actually uh, focused on appropriate scale, appropriate to the biosphere in which, we, in which the business is embedded. Secondly, we need to focus on wealth as not only involving financial capital, but wealth actually involving all aspects of well-being of all kinds of life on the planet. And therefore, wealth uh, would also mean spiritual capital. Wealth will mean intellectual capital. Wealth will mean uh, human capital. So wealth has various manifestations and maybe financial capital is uh, the least important of uh, this. Uh, moreover, it's important to understand that participation is important rather than competition in order to bring about well-being. A fifth principle is that uh, respect for nature and respect for uh, marginalized uh, communities, uh, respect for knowledge of uh, the indigenous communities needs to be respected 
particularly because that is unique and that can help tide over many of the problems we have. Uh, moreover, it's important to work at the interfaces with indigenous communities, with youngsters, with uh, business people, uh, with the government. So more collaboration will actually bring in various perspectives of a problem and a solution so that uh, we could foster greater learning and development over there. So uh, uh, another principle that we need to focus on is moving out of uh, wasteful flows towards circulatory flows, whether it is money or resources or information. And finally, we need to move out of myopic short-term thinking in terms of profit maximization to creating long-term balance in terms of many parameters but a small and large need to coexist together. Efficiency and resilience need to be worked out. Collaboration and competition need to coexist just as much as diversity and individuality need to be uh, put on balance. Next, please. Next, please. Okay, so the backdrop for reshaping business towards making it more responsible for regeneration is already provided in terms of the global goals template. And the focus definitely uh, why we need to think about education is that uh, goal number four, quality education, which addresses education at all levels, uh, from the pre-primary level up until the higher education level, uh, needs to be thought of in terms of uh, improvements that will foster regeneration. So business education is not out. It is very much within the scheme of things of the sustainable development goals. Next, please. Uh, so we need to look at uh, what kind of capacity sets or what kind of skill sets responsible business education can bring. Uh, to uh, our learners. Uh, like I said, uh, nature, nature detached needs to move into being nature smart. But just a word over here, if you, I think we've, many of us have heard of Harvard Gardner, Professor Harvard Gardner of Harvard University Department of Neuropsychology, who has uh, put uh, naturalist intelligence as the eighth intelligence and says that our educational systems are hopeless in being able to create naturalist intelligence of being able to understand nature in all its diversity and have an intuitive uh, you know, feel for uh, the beauty and the preservation of nature. So this is something that business education has to work towards. And then again, reflection, as I said, uh, uh, with analysis, reflection is important as much as appreciative inquiry, which means trying to get the best out of people, uh, get the best out of one's own self, but also to get the best out of the people that business leaders work with. And then of course, the many other things that I've already touched upon as part of my paper, uh, but more importantly is that when businesses, business education handles projects or dissertations uh, during its coursework, it would be great if uh, real world problem solving is part of the contextual basis of business education so that uh, youngsters can readily relate to the problems that they're facing and then they can use their skills to apply them to these problems and have a sense of fulfillment when they are able to be a part of the problem solution uh, to the challenges that they're facing. So, uh, along with digital fluency and along with uh, analytical skills, these are many of the other skills that uh, also need to be harnessed and to be inculcated in uh, both educators and learners. Next, please. So I'm making an appeal to change our surface approach to education, which is very, very course driven, very, very driven towards curriculum. So you're so happy when you finish the syllabus towards uh, making some kind of sense to our youngsters. The deep approach is to understand ideas, to internalize ideas and to create some kind of sense to 
whoever is involved or engaged in learning. So we need to move away from uh, just uh, looking at the course as unrelated bits of knowledge and pushing them down the student in terms of ev evaluation procedures and ha having them memorize facts, theories, uh, models, algorithms, uh, formulae uh, that they can't make sense of. And that is one reason that we also find why people, these youngsters uh, find it very attractive to cheat in exams. Okay, so we need to move out of this and focus more on uh, evaluation, evaluating critical reflection capacities in, uh, in the youngster, uh, which means that this could also raise questions some of which we find silly in the class when uh, somebody asks a question uh, about one's own experiences. So there are many changes that we will need to make. And the foremost change of, is of course thinking in terms of why we are into pedagogy. And like, uh, like I said, from transmitting to transforming should be our major purpose. Next, please. Okay, I'm nearing the end of my presentation. And so I would just like to give a word of optimism over here. Uh, while the 17 goals are before us and uh, business education can actually be linked with all of these 17 goals, whether you're looking at reduction of hunger or no poverty or reduction of inequalities, women empowerment, climate change, uh, sustainable consumption, just to name a few, uh, as empowerment of indigenous people, uh, actually business education could work with each one of these goals. But then business education needs to be more issue-based. Issue-based, I mean, you need to move out of the functional silos of HR and uh, you know, human resource and IT and marketing and finance and accounting and move more towards maybe goal-oriented education. So could management education shape up in terms of these 17 goals? And then maybe uh, whether we're looking in terms of uh, theories or whether we're looking in terms of case writing or whether we're looking in terms of projects, if they could be geared towards these goals, then the students will feel empowered to be part, however small, of real world problem solving. So the United Nations has actually come up with the principles for responsible management education way back in 2017, uh, in 2007. And in 2017, they revised these to uh, work in tandem with the uh, sustainable development goals. And so we have the PR, PRME uh, that forges the SDGs, that is sustainable development goals. And uh, next slide, please. What uh, is required for the PRME to work on uh, is move for business education for sustainability from merely tinkering with environmental education or having a paper on business ethics and uh, environmental management to actually having business education for sustainability, which is uh, version two, I would say, because business education for sustainability is driven towards systemic change. It's just not tinkering with a few ideas and making sure that companies are uh, not condemned or as being unsustainable or they are not seen as violating environmental regulations. So when we're looking at change, businesses need to leverage their knowledge towards systemic change. So this is one thing. The second is a recognition of the circularity of the economic system, because that is how systems in nature function. They don't function linearly. Number three is it's important to understand that business is not about just creating profits, but about creating a net positive social and uh, environmental influence for human existence. Number four, there has to be a major change in human values. That means what we expect of business and in our behaviors. Like I said, uh, competition has to give way to collaboration. Short-term thinking has to give way to long-term balanced behaviors. Uh, efficiency, uh, an all-out focus on efficiency has to, has to be driven more towards 
issues of resilience, something that we are talking about now, you may actually forego a little bit of efficiency to think in terms of resilience. So a lot of our behaviors need to change. Uh, next, we think have to think not just of creating financial value or value of business and financial terms, but we need to think of creating value in all aspects, uh, maybe a suboptimal solution to say, so economic value needs to be done just as much as environmental value and social value. All of this, as we understand as the triple bottom line, need to be uh, internalized or needs to be factored into the business uh, in terms of cost reduction, in terms of value creation, in terms of product development, in terms of process improvement, in terms of technology development. So all of this has to be uh, driven by uh, a new vision of uh, uh, regeneration. Uh, and this is why the design approach is becoming very, very important because uh, it's just not products that need to be re redesigned. Processes, human psyches, human values, all of these require a design change. And once these happen, uh, students need to be focused more on creating uh, their viewpoints or their ambitions, not just on job seeking or uh, having placements with high pay packets, but on having more meaningful lifelong careers out of management education. So uh, these changes uh, are what uh, business education should be working towards. Next slide, please. And for these changes to come about, uh, business education will be in a position, will be in the driver's seat to create new openings or new avenues for business enterprises to think differently in terms of new conceptions of what business is about, the role of business. So business, as I said, as an organization of positive change, new conceptions of market parameters. So moving out of mere revenue generation to having a meaningful experience of products and services, new concepts of systems parameters. So moving out of linearity to, move, to moving in terms of regenerative capacity, new concepts of operational parameters. For example, thinking in terms of uh, sustainable supply chains of engaging uh, the marginalized, of engaging the poor, as part of the business value chain so that uh, poverty divides, digital divides can be leveled over time. Uh, new conceptions of organizational parameters. We need to move away from ownership concepts to more of usership concepts uh, because uh, asset ownership creates waste. Asset ownership is something that definitely creates waste. So if we think more in terms of collaboration, we also think in terms of newer kinds of organizational evolution. For instance, so when we think in terms of shared networks or the shared economy, uh, stakeholder engagement, these are newer ways of looking at uh, the same organization. And finally, when all these changes happen, then business needs to be measured and business performance needs to be understood on very different grounds. So these metrics are also emanating from business education. So the business metrics need to change and regenerative capacity therefore should become a central business metric. Resilience should be a central business metric. Flexibility should be a, an important business metric rather than focus on the financial parameters that seem to be overstressed as far as business education is concerned. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Just to go back to the uh, PRME, the United Nations, uh, United Nations Global Compact uh, Initiative uh, for uh, having uh, business uh, B schools and all other institutions imparting business education uh, align with the uh, agenda 2030. There are six principles here that we need to work upon. Uh, number one is we need to redirect purpose of the organization. And instead of thinking in terms of creating employability and placements, 
we need to think more in terms of creating sustainable, uh, responsible sustainability champions. How many of us would think that one sustainability champion among the students would actually uh, justify the teaching of, an, of a business course? So this is a major change that we need to bring about. Uh, values, I've already mentioned it, that institutions' values need to be focused uh, on the SDGs because it serves as a comprehensive uh, template for how to handle the kind of complexity that we're facing right now. Methods need to change drastically. I've already focused on how transmission should give way to transformative learning and transformative learning should actually be engaging all levels, the individual as much as uh, the societal, as much as the organization, as much as uh, other stakeholders, including nature. So a lot of extracurricular activities should be stressed. Uh, what, what we call extracurricular should actually become intracurricular. Uh, so that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, uh, we need to uh, you know, change the divide between extra and intracurricular. That needs to change. Uh, another important thing is uh, when you're looking at research and uh, being a researcher myself and a research supervisor, I rarely find research being relevant to the kind of problems we're facing. Most of the research uh, that uh, we do, at least in the domain of business, is some fancied research either uh, dictated by the supervisor or uh, what catches the fancy of the uh, research scholar herself or himself. So if those were more attuned to the realities of uh, and the complexities of the world, uh, it would make much more sense, both in claiming that uh, uh, world problems are being solved, that would definitely also improve our ratings and rankings in terms of maybe Times Higher Education ranking, which now talks in terms of creating global impact, or the AACSB, which has included social and environmental uh, sustainability as an important accreditation norm. So when you're looking at these international norms for uh, ranking and rating of uh, education, uh, having research uh, focus on real world problem solving uh, would definitely uh, be a lot of help. Uh, and then uh, engaging with relevant stakeholders uh, uh, with respect to each of the uh, uh, global goals at various levels. So these are things that we can definitely work on uh, right now uh, because a lot of these require reflection. So I think since we are all locked up at home, many of us can engage in a lot of reflection now as to how these things can be brought about. Maybe the action can wait till things become a little normal. And finally, like we are doing right now, reaching out to others, sharing knowledge instead of hoarding knowledge. Of course, uh, given uh, that people don't violate uh, intellectual property rights, uh, people uh, engage in, as I said, appreciative inquiries. So they are not uh, going to be uh, attracted and uh, tempted by uh, que ethically questionable behaviors like plagiarism. So sharing knowledge honestly and sharing knowledge with a sense of purpose. So these are things that the PRME has stood for, these six principles, and some things that we can all try to put in our own institutions, given the existing context of the institution, of course. Uh, there is no uh, you know, holy grail, there's no one size fits all. It will all depend upon what the institution is already doing, because uh, this has to be an evolution. I'm not saying that it has to be a revolution. So you just scrap off everything that was happening and change over to something that is totally new that we cannot do. So these are some uh, straight thoughts that I thought uh, that I found important to share with you. I hope it did make some sense uh, given the kind of hopelessness that we are facing uh, all over. Uh, and uh, some, uh, I'm not saying this is a, a pathway that I'm charting, but I think a few ideas here and there could probably give us clues as to how we can uh, face the future and have our youngsters, uh, the next generation face the future. Techno fixes will not be the only solution. I can watch that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Madam, uh, for your uh, valuable lecture. And uh, as we are all engrossed with your thought-provoking uh, uh, the audition, your skill, and the discourses. 
like we have to, we used to do it uh, in our college and university this are the different seminars and webinars we used to watch with ma'am over the years so ma'am uh, basically we have a lot of questions but uh, due to the positive of time i am only addressing two questions i'm just only taking two questions for your okay. uh, attention sure. uh, just in it ma'am uh, actually uh, we are we are uh, having uh, the two questions which are actually similar we are we are launching this pro program both in youtube and the zoom and youtube mm -hmm. live uh, channel uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the the person uh, uh, dr shubhang shupan uh, he had yes. asked a question how new normal school of social behavior change be affected us in near future how children will manage themselves uh, with not to share anything with others and also the um, another question is also in uh, closely related with the uh, with the, that type of the queries uh, uh but uh, 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 dr odhikar uh, uh, mm -hmm. she is asking here also asked this question in the zoom chat box uh, she yes. asked this question what are the effective approaches to connect children with nature so basically mr pan dr uh, pan and dr uh, mukherjee had asked about how uh, neuro normal okay. schools will be affected uh, and Please, I think uh, many of us in the baby boomer generation, I think most of these questions are coming from us. Yeah. Uh, and we know yeah. the problem. We know that our children are into videos, into memes, into uh, more of the te technological gadgetry than we have ever been. Uh, but And yeah. also when we narrate some of our association with nature in our younger days, uh, walks, maybe uh, walking into forests or looking at uh, looking uh, at the beauty and majesty of mountains, uh, I'm so sure that uh, little children, no matter how little they are, they are overjoyed in seeing nature in its bounty, not in PowerPoint presentations. So although we are in a very tight situation right now, but this is not going to be prolonged. And therefore, one way is to travel. And I'm not saying, again, very costly travel. Uh, there are ways to uh, engage the student. And I'm saying that, I mean, uh, doing it from the young age. So I think it's more in the hands of the parents, not just the teachers who need to uh, create an interest in the mind of the child uh, in, into observing nature more minutely, into observing insects, into observing plants, into observing uh, just maybe the grass growing. You know, if there is a lot of time spent on techno, uh, technological gadgetry, then the child's attention uh, is removed from nature. You know, because see, this is all very easy to get. Touch screen uh, and uh, gadgetry is all there at home. So when they're engaged in viewing a movie on Netflix or uh, you know, engaged in many of these other things, they would not want to spend time uh, engaging with nature. So it's up to us to have them uh, re-engage with nature. But once you do that, they're very interested. I'm sure that all of us will say when we take our children uh, you know, on vacation to uh, any place, whatever the place be, whether it's the mountains or the seas or the forests or to any place of architectural or archeological beauty, they are wonderstruck. But again, here I would say, it's important for them to experience it rather than uh, be obsessed with taking photographs. Uh, it's okay taking a few photographs, but if they focus on the photographs uh -huh. too much, Definitely. then they forget. Uh, yes, they, that that intimacy, that that uh, experience that they can uh, take with them for a lifelong uh, uh, treasure is something they will miss out. Uh, so I think this uh, needs to be nurtured more and a balance. I'm not saying to put that off. Techno gadgetry is here to stay, but I think a balance needs to be created. And uh, many other problems like obesity and you know uh, feeding on junk foods, because all this happens when you uh, you know become a couch potato and sit in the comfort mm -hmm. of your drawing room and uh, just walk, focus on the screen. So I think a lot of this could be handled. And if this is handled at home and this is the demand of parents, I think uh, parents are important stakeholders in the education system. So if we demand certain things as parents, then even the education system will find it easier to respond to the changes. Just like technology is ruling because that is a demand that is coming. Uh, see, the, the pure bioscience subjects are giving way to uh, biotechnology because, uh, or genome projects or 
to genetic engineering because that's the, the priorities that parents are setting. So, you know, I think this is a major problem in the priority, uh, prioritization of the priorities uh, needs to be done and over there balancing is important. Balancing is very important. Uh, but children are receptive. Yes, children are receptive. I have to say children are receptive. They're like a, they're like a clean slate. Whatever you give them, they will take. Like we took, we took from our parents, so they will take. They will take from their teachers and parents because they respect them. In fact, this whole idea of respect needs to be rethought. You know, how to respect. You know, when I'm talking about human behavior, the whole issue of how to respect is also important. When you, and therefore, self-respect is a starting point. If you don't respect yourself, there's a little chance that you can respect anything else. Parents, teachers, nature, you're know, talking about all of this is a far cry uh, first to develop the sense of value. That's why I talk about appreciative inquiry. If sense of appreciation needs to be all around, instead of criticism and, you know, the criticism and mudslinging, baseless criticism and uh, all sorts of things that uh, go to demean the value of human existence. As it is, children are stressed. I think this can support, this can be in their support. Uh, and nature, like uh, my earlier speaker was saying, uh, nature doesn't charge you for oxygen, but the human systems charge you for oxygen. Mm -hmm. So when mm -hmm. they are in league, they are in tune with nature, when they visit nature, they will understand how much nature gives at no cost. So they will have a new idea of cost. They will have a new idea of value. Their eyes will open to these things. Uh, so I think it's a, it's just not a concept of environmental service or ecosystem services. They will really feel it. The feeling part is very important. Definitely. Definitely. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, sir, for providing us the guidance and the about the, the, the point that you mentioned is our duty of what do we write answer? in this? Yeah, did definitely. I did, did I answer definitely. both these questions? I, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, 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 midway yes. between the two. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, definitely, definitely. What you have said, clean, children are the clean slate. It is the duty of our, of us, the teachers and the, yes. and the parents. Uh, so it, what they should write down. Yeah. It's unfortunate yes, that as college teachers and university teachers, we uh -huh. meet these students when they are already nine, 18, 19 years old. Yeah. And we yes. meet them when they are 20 plus. So by yeah. then their ideas and their yeah. assumptions are already so yeah. formed. It's very difficult to change them for yeah. just That's two years or three years. It's so responsible. It's a joint responsibility for the nature. In four Please. semesters, six thank semesters, you, you can't make changes. Yes. Yeah, thank definitely. you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. So, thank you, ma'am, for your thought provoking lecture and hope you will come again with us definitely. whenever we need you. Definitely. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank, us. Thanks thank to you, you and thanks to all the college authority yeah. and to well, the IQAC. Yeah. And I would congratulate the IQAC because I was part of the IQAC for thinking of holding this uh, very important topic right now. Thank you. On behalf of the College Authority, I just go my thanks on you. Now. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thanks. Now it's the time to uh, 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 just uh, welcome our uh, co convener of this session of this program, um, webinar, uh, Dr. Uh, Papia Ghosh Chatterjee. Uh, please uh, conduct the session and uh, go for it. Amit, please, am I audible? Perfect. Yeah, yeah, you are very much audible. Okay. I just like to share my screen yeah, for yeah. just one minute for introduction of yeah. Dr. Smith. I'm sharing my slide on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do it, do it. Is it visible? It is very much visible. Yeah. Okay. Just, 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 just make it just uh, above. Yeah. The, uh, it's the okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fine. Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. First, I uh, would like to. Uh, say sorry to Dr. Smith for such a prolonged delay. Uh, extremely sorry, ma'am. Uh, this was due to technical error, you can understand. Now I am really privileged as well as charmed to introduce you, ma'am. So you can see over here that Dr. Barbara Smith, she is the Associate Professor, Center for Agroecology, Water and Resilience, Coventry University, UK. Beside that, she is also the chair of the Agricultural Ecology Special Interest Group of the British Ecological Society. She is also the Associate Director of the Center for Pollination Studies at the University of Calcutta since 2012. Dr. Smith is very much associated with application-based research. He 
works actually as a consultant ecologist on habitat restoration projects, specializing in aggregate sites, carrying out primary botanical research, and working in partnership with industry, local communities, local authorities, and NGOs of her research interest. She has collaboration with the industry and academic partners in the UK and academic partners across Europe. Much of her work has been carried out on firms and through this, she has really developed a supportive network of the stakeholder. Her recent work in India has resulted in a strong partnership with farmers, academic colleagues and policymakers. And from the slide over here, no need to tell about the publication, about the research contribution. You can see the citation and high age index of Dr. Smith. So I don't think this need much elaboration. She has published more than 28 journals and she is well known throughout the world for her contribution in restoration ecology. Beside that, I want to tell you, this is the fingerprint, probably it is not properly visible to you, but in many areas of agricultural biology and earth and environmental sciences, she has actually her fingerprint. You can go to the net and find that well, the, the, the worst area where actually she is working and really it is an application based work and her talk is really related to sustainability, related to biodiversity. I mean to say biological sustainability. Her aspect will cover biological sustainability. So ma'am, I welcome you again, sorry for the delay, but one more thing I like to share with you that beside all of these activities, publication, recognition, she is a very, very, very good human being, very down to earth. And moreover, she is very much familiar to the Indian culture. That's why I want to share this uh, photograph of Dr. Smith with you. So thank you, ma'am. Now it's over to you. So um, you share your screen. I am just. Thank you so much for such a lovely, warm introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here today. And I just want to say how uh, I and, have stopped uh, sharing you. You share your screen, ma'am. I will do. Yeah. And I will just share your screen and on your. Uh... OK, let me see. Hang on a moment, I just need to do that. You have a green share screen. What I would like to do today is um, talk about the practical application of integrating biodiversity conservation into sustainable development. And um, as Papia just said, I am working mostly in agricultural ecology. So I will be using examples from agricultural ecology. So in the next 35 or 40 minutes, um, I will first just look at a little bit at how the world has agreed to manage biodiversity and sustainable development and then look at some of the frameworks that we can use for doing it in practice and then the main part of my talk will be sharing stories of how two groups of people have done it one in india and one in the uk and at the end just as a little burst of optimism for us i have a very short three minute film to finish us off okay so how do we how does the world go about implementing biodiversity con conservation? So it's through global agreements. And there are two frameworks that we work with. And the first one um, that I would like to talk about is the Convention on Biological, Biological Diversity, which has come up with 20 targets, the Aichi Biodiversity Targets. So the targets address particular issues. They address several things. They address particular issues, climate change, pollution, loss of natural habitats. And they also target different levels of biodiversity, genetic biodiversity, whole ecosystems, protected areas. And then there's a level of um, conservation that's targeted involving people directly. So encouraging public awareness, looking at economic issues. So the Convention on Biological Diversity, although it is concerned mostly with, mostly with natural ecosystems, it 
also recognises that this is about people. It's about our need for food security, medicines, fresh air, water, shelter, and a clean and healthy environment in which to live. 168 states have signed up to the um, Aichi targets. And in addition to this, we have, as the previous speakers have so, out, have so clearly outlined, we have the Sustainable Development Goals. And the Sustainable Development Goals are very high level goals. They are very ambitious. They are to end poverty, end hunger, increase health. They're all high level and very, um, as I say, very ambitious. The ones that we are, the one that we are mostly concerned with is goal 15, which is life on land, and also goal 14, which is life in water. I, I've pulled out goal 15 here. And I just want to share with you that goal 15 says we must protect, restore and promote sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, sustainably, sustainably manage forests, combat desertification and halt and reverse land degradation and biodiversity loss. It is a high level ambitious goal. And in addition to this, the sustainable development goals instruct us that we should leave no one behind. So while we are um, surging forward to implement all these goals, we must ensure that the most vulnerable in society are also included. So we have these two frameworks that we use, but they do overlap and they do not contradict each other. And I realize that this is a lot of information to take in. But if, for example, we just take the, um, the sustainable development goal number one, which is to end poverty in all its forms everywhere. It does overlap with the Aichi targets. So the Aichi target for biodiversity being integrated into national and local decision-making is also important to ending poverty. Managing marine resources and sustainable agriculture and managing ecosystem services these map onto each other so that when we are looking at our global targets, we can use these two frameworks to guide us. And that helps us in our practice. It's also important to recognize that biodiversity is very important to human health. And this human biodiversity, I mean, many people would say that biodiversity actually underpins human health. This is rather nice um, European Union diagram shows us. Biodiversity supports human health in two ways, either directly because we get ecosystem services and healthy land for us to live in. It supports us via providing um, medical medicines and our food, but also indirectly. When we, when we manage biodiversity, we manage the, way, the world in a way that also supports human health. So there's a direct and indirect and a direct and indirect route for biodiversity being good for humans. But the problem with global goals is, these massive goals, is that they are just so big. They are very high level, they are very ambitious. What does this mean for individuals on the ground? Here is a beekeeper. He is showing us a really nice traditional way of keeping bees in clay pots. But how do these massive goals impact on his life? And what hope can a beekeeper in a village or in any area of the world hope to deliver the sustainable development goals? We need to narrow down. Although it's important to be holistic in our approach, we can't do everything at once. So I suggest, maybe just because it's my area of interest, that we could begin with agriculture. Why agriculture? because the global food system is the single largest driver of biodiversity loss worldwide. It's amazing when we think that agriculture, apart from the land that is total ice or desert, agriculture occupies 40%, roughly 40% of that land. And it's directly responsible for 80% of tropical forest clearance and of near, near threatened species, 62% of losses are due to the expansion and intensification of agriculture. If we can have a positive impact through agriculture and through the global food system, 
then we may have some hope of starting to reverse some of the biodiversity losses. But it's not simple because as the previous speakers have outlined, it's not, the world is not a reduced place. It is a complex system and the global food system is no, is no exception to that. The global food system is not just about how we manage a few, a few fields or how we manage our cattle. It has got governance in there. It has culture, it has tradition, it has economy. David Wharton Toes in 2004 said that given the messy nature of the dilemmas and the contradictions that face us, there can be no single recipe and no definitive, definitive set of tools. And this is true. So we have to choose something, something that we can work with. So I'd like to present two frameworks that I think can be useful. And the first one is one that I think is rather overlooked. Again, it comes from the Convention on Biological Diversity, and it's called the ecosystem approach. We do talk about ecosystems a lot, but these 12 principles are very useful. So it highlights the fact that ecosystems must be managed within the limits of their functioning, that when we manage one part of the system, another part of the system is affected, and with, that we have to look at the varying temporal scales and time lag effects that characterise ecosystem processes in order to determine how we might measure them. But what I would like to do is here is just outline three and um, just highlight three of them. The first one, the objectives of management of land and water and living resources are a matter of societal choices. And I think this is really important when we're thinking about our practical application of some of these higher level goals. What we decide to do about biodiversity, what we want to have, is our choice. Maybe there's no right and wrong. We can manage biodiversity for all kinds of things, for the goods that it gives us, because we think it's beautiful. But whatever we choose, that's a societal choice, and we need to remember that. The second thing is that management should be decentralised to the lowest appropriate level. So the management of the ecosystem is managed by individuals at the end of the day, and people manage things well when they are invested in them and they care about them. And it makes sense then that management is decentralised to the lowest possible level. It's very difficult for somebody sitting in um, a global centre of government to decide how to measure a few fields on the other side of the world and how to manage them. And then the other thing that I think is really important is that the ecosystem approach should involve all relevant sectors of society and scientific disciplines. We do need to come together and we do need to make sure that everybody is involved if we are to leave no one behind. So another um, framework that I'd like to present to you is this one by David Wartner Toes again in his book, Ecosystem, Eco, sustainab Ecosystem, Sustainability and Health, A Practical Approach. Now, he was a very interesting man. He's an epidemiologist and he works in medicine. And he said that the world managing an ecosystem, managing our natural systems, is akin to how we manage um, health in a human being. We begin when somebody comes and presents us with symptoms. So when we think about our ecosystem, we could say, what are the symptoms? And the next thing one does is one talks to the patient and says, well, what is your story so far? And then they give some kind of description of their symptoms. And the doctor then analyzes that. And we can do the same with our ecosystem. We can say, well, what is the underlying problem? Somebody might have come with a headache, but the headache is only the symptom. What is that underlying problem? And whose problem is it? And who is involved in that problem? And what are the central issues? And in the same way, we can do this with our ecosystem. So if our problem is that there is polluted water, we can say, well, what is causing that, that, that problem? This is a way of reducing down our problems so that we can understand them holistically but still get a handle on them because we need to be able to get a handle on the problem before we can deal with it. And then we go into what I would think of as the sort of scientific part of this, this process 
we ask what the nature of the system is, what the problem is, we look at how the whole system works, and we look at the links and we look at how those factors relate. So this is when we go out and we might measure what biodiversity is out in the environment, we look at how one part of the system affects another part of the system, and we should include um, a social science part to that as well because our systems are holistic. Once we understand the system, we know what the problem is, we then have to work towards solutions. And this is when the scientists come back into the community and say, okay, what are the potential solutions? What are the trade-offs? If we alter this part of the ecosystem, what effect will have that, that have on the local economy? Will people really engage in this solution? And then we test the solutions, we test them in practice, and then we monitor the outcome. And then we go back to the problem. Okay, have we solved our, solved our problem? And I like this system because I think it gives us a very nice roadmap for tackling what can be a very complex environment. So what I'd like to say, what I'd like to do now is in this world of messy dilemmas that David, David Wartner Toes talks about, what examples do we have of showing how we can integrate biodiversity conservation into sustainable development? And I have two examples, two case studies here to present to you. So the first case study is that of pollinator decline in India. So in 2011, Patip Bazu pe published a paper in which he noted a decline in pollinator dependent vegetable crop productivity in India indicates potent pollinator limitation. So there was our symptom. Our symptom was a decline in vegetable crop productivity. So then the next thing to do was to go out and look at the system and have an examination and say, well, you know, what is the situation? What is the story so far? And what we found was, was that in certain instances, farmers were having to hand pollinate their crops because they didn't have enough pollinators in order to produce their crops. The other thing we did was we went and looked at landscapes. And you can see here that there are two landscapes. One is quite complex and one is simple. And this is showing how agricultural intensification affects landscapes. They move from a situation where there's a lot of natural habitat um, and a little agricultural land, and the agricultural land here is in yellow, to, to a situation where there is a lot of agricultural land, and very little natural vegetation and some urban areas. And the other thing we noted was that there was a lot of pesticides being sprayed in the natural environment. The other thing we learned was that we don't really know very much. In terms of pollination, certainly back then in 2011, um, there were big knowledge gaps. People were studying pollinators and pollination, but we had a big gap in our understanding of which, pollen which pollinators pollinated which crops. Indeed, we have quite a large gap and still have quite a large gap in actually identifying a lot of pollinators. And we certainly don't know how they interact in all the different systems. So we have a, lar a large number of questions which need to be addressed and which needed to be addressed. So we instigated a project that was about enhancing the relationship between people and pollinators. And given the, uh, our examination of the system, we created two goals for this project at the national level. So at the global level, our goal was to meet the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is the, at the le which is the goal for all biological conservation projects. But at the national level, we realized that we needed to understand pollination systems. And we focused on Eastern India because again, at some point you have to restrict yourself so that you can get to grip with the system. And the second national goal was to facilitate conservation improvement of native pollination services to benefit subsistence farming communities. And at the bottom, I've put down some of the international goals that this project works towards meeting. So although it's a, bio a biological conservation project, it's still meeting goals of reducing hunger, of decent work, of sustainable production. And it's to show, to just to demonstrate really how biodiversity really can be at the heart of a lot of sustainable development. 
And the next thing we did was we went and we looked at who was going to be involved in this um, in this project. Who had who were the stakeholders? So the stakeholders were clearly the farmers and the local communities who live in these environments and who control that environment, but also the scientists who can understand the system and work with local people to discover more about it. And then of course, national government and local governments, the panchayat and the tribal councils who are so um, influential in how local systems are managed. And then policymakers who can support um, who can support um, farmers and support um, scientists in implementing change. We then, um, we then determined four local goals. So the local goals were to work with local communities to gather data. So that, that information that was missing, we thought it was really important to work with local people and in order to um, discover more about pollinators in farming environments. And then the next goal was to improve local awareness of pollinators and their role in crop production. People are busy. They are working in their general lives. It is not surprising if people aren't thinking about bees. So this project was partly just to raise the issue around the um, detrimental effect of farming practice on pollinators. And then we were to work with farmers to help them make their farms pollinator friendly and then to increase pollinator diversity and abundance. And that then would improve pollination of crops and improve yields, which was a benefit to everybody. We, we determined four routes to our goals. So I think that these four components are really important and it's really useful to think about them when you're planning a project. I mean, first we have science, which is about the identity and distribution and ecology of pollinators. And then there's education, joining people together, university and community, so that there is co-learning. Policy and governance, both at the state and the community level, because without the support of policy and governance, we really don't have very much hope. <laughs> and then participation, both in research and in knowledge exchange. Again, this idea that we work together with communities so that it's not just a process where we bring our science to the community and then impose it. At the heart of this project was the Centre for Pollination Studies at Calcutta University. And I'm really just showing you this picture to introduce you to everybody and show you the great team that was working out in the field um, implementing this project. So what did we do? So our first, um, our first aim was to look at the identity and distribution of the pollinators. Um, we worked in Tripura and Odisha, um, two sites, and we set up, we started off by setting up some long-term monitoring at 15 sites um, in each of those areas, because we really did know very little about even what bees lived where. Um, in order to do um, some of the analytical work, we we're very lucky at, um, to have um, a visitor, Stuart Roberts, who's a pollinator expert, and he came and helped us set up a laboratory with um, good lab craft. He is an excellent taxonomist, and this was a, an area in which we wanted to learn more. And so he came and together we set up a, labo uh, a laboratory, and now we have a, um, a wide collection of pollinators that are available for anyone to come and study. So we maintain collections, collections and carry out academic research. And the science that we did in those two regions was participatory science. So the farmers were involved right from the beginning. They set up the pan traps, our sampling procedure, and they collected insects and they gave them to local field assistants. And then the field assistants processed the samples and sent them to the university and at the university they were analyzed. So there was a knowledge cascade. Um, at the university, we set up an academic research, a research unit. In the field, there were field stations with local field advisors and the local field advisors were recruited from the local villages and they were trained. It was really important that the advisors were embedded in the local communities so that the knowledge was, was 
equitably distributed. And the local farm advisors, and we had village coordinators as well, worked with farmers and showed them how to set up the pan traps and showed them how to sort the insects in some cases. So there was education and links with the local um, farm advisors. And then the information was sent back to the university and not just samples, but also feedback on how well the sampling was going and any suggestions that came from the farmers. The problem with the research that we were doing is it was a snapshot. So in the future, that long-term monitoring will of course give us um, a good time series. But for the present moment, we don't know anything about the past. And so in order to gather some information about how the situation had been up until the moment that we came to the university, um, came to the farms and to the areas, we were gathering knowledge with local communities and we did this in focus groups. And we, we instigated con con conversations with a wide range of people um, in several groups across both states. And this yielded a lot of really useful information that we couldn't have poss possibly gathered on our own. And we also talked to the farmers about the kinds of solutions that they thought would be useful in terms of restoring biodiversity. And this was a really core part of the work and very important for us. So I'd just like to share some of the things that um, we learned. So here's some of the um, results from the science. What we learned was, was that agriculture intensification at the landscape scale leads to pollinator declines. And if we want to restore pollinators, we have to improve the way that we farm. We also found out that adequate pollination of crops relies on having natural vegetation in the area. And we've managed to hone in on a couple of crops. So for example, Brinjal, we need 27% of the local area to have natural vegetation, but for mustard, only 18% is necessary. And this kind of information is gonna be very important in the future for future management planning. We found that sowing wildflowers will help attract pollinating insects to crops. And we've also been able to identify particular wildflowers that might be particularly attractive. There's been a, a, quite a lot of work done on pesticides and part of the work found that pesticides put bees under stress. Now that stress is sublethal, it may not kill the bees, but it may affect their foraging and productivity. So over time, the pesticides could have a hidden effect that we can't see right at the moment. And then we found that there was an important role for indigenous knowledge in understanding local pollinator management. Another part of the information that we found is we were well, really important for us was we found out which bees visit which crops. So these two diagrams here are network diagrams and on the bottom they have plant species and on the top they have bee species and these are visitation networks. So what we did was we observed which bees visited which crops. And these networks show you which crops are the most visited, which bees visit them, and which bees are the most important in terms of their visitation and potential pollination. And this information has been invaluable for us. And we also found um, some species, new species and rare species, in particular, here is a nice new species, species new to science that was discovered during the project. From the work that we did with the local communities, we found information. So this information, we gathered information from farmers about which bee species they thought had changed in their population numbers. Now we understand that probably the farmers weren't focusing on those bees before we talked to them. They probably weren't spending a lot of their life wondering what had happened to the blue banded bee. But when we spoke to people in focus groups, we were able to determine which species they thought had declined. And we spoke to many groups of farmers and they all gave us the same kind of answer. So although we know that this number is an estimation, these declines are estimations. We also know that this is really important information and we mustn't ignore it. So we do have some, some, some evidence that bee species are declining and restoration is necessary. We also talked to the farmers about solutions and these are the solutions that they came up with. 
They said that we should reduce pesticide use, plant more big trees, conserve natural habitat and introduce beehives. So, so what are some of the impacts that this project had? Beside each of these impacts, you'll see that I've put again some of these icons for the different goals from the Aichi targets and the sustainability goals. And really, it's just to underline this, um, underline this idea that because you are dealing with a small element of biodiversity, it doesn't mean it's not having a big effect across multiple goals. In Trapura, we found that the farmers were in touch with field assistants to ask for information about pollinators and for ideas about how to implement sustainable, sustainable agriculture. So there was a real interest generated and people were very keen to actually do something practical. Farmers in both Odisha and Trapura have been using mustard and other flowers as a reservoir crop for pollinating insects and trap crops for pests. So some of the ideas that were generated during the project are being implemented independently now within the communities. And farmers in Odisha reported that since they adopted their new farming practices, they'd seen a 10% increase in yield. So this, is, this has a wide ranging impacts on both hunger, on economy, as well as on biodiversity. Pesticide use was associated with a set of specific symptoms that were consistently reported across all sites and in all regions. And pesticides are well known for having bad impact on farmers' health. And so the farmers reported feeling healthier, healthier after they reduced their pesticide use. And this, this touches on one of the other goals, which is health and well-being. And in addition, the farmers had asked local government for pheromone traps and received them. So there is now a link between the farmers and the local government that's based on sustainable development. So there's lots of potential for some really exciting and practical um, outcomes from a project that was ostensibly focusing on quite a small element of biodiversity. Of course, there were challenges. So we had challenges finding permanent sites for our long-term monitoring. But we worked with local government, the Panchayat and the tribal councils to identify sites. And of course, there were problems in that farmers didn't always think that our pollinators were the most important thing. <laughs> this was our idea and they expressed real concern over pest problems. So rather than say this isn't important to us, we are now working with farmers to develop natural pest control strategies. And I think this underlines the importance of conversation and constant being flexible in the face of um, just being flexible while you're working. So the best practice recommendations from this project, I think, were, were as follows. I mean, you can read them, but I think it's really important to acknowledge that you need to find an entry point to raise awareness about, about your topic. So maybe the people that we went to visit weren't that interested in pollination, but by talking to them about natural pest control, they were willing to listen to, to, to us talking about pollination. And now we're working on that project together. It's really important to employ local people to ensure decent work and fair conditions. If we have all these high-minded goals for sustainable development, we have to practice what we preach and start right at the beginning with ourselves. It was important to invest in local community representatives because, it, you know, some far off person just isn't important to our community, any community. We listen to the people that we know and we respect. So working with the local leaders was also really important. And the other thing was it was really important that the university researchers went out into the field. It made it real for the university researchers, but it also put a human face on the research. So it was working with people and spending time together that was really important. And we also, we didn't pay beneficiaries and local NGOs. And I think this was a real strength in the end. And in the end, it enhanced the credibility of the project. Bringing in, bringing in payment introduces all sorts of power inequalities that you cannot control and may not even be aware of. And so if possible, it's better to avoid it. And what I'd like to just underline is you know, the goal might be biodiversity, but the best practice is about people and that this best practice also promotes other aspects of sustainable development. 
Okay, so I just so now I'd like to move to the UK. So we've got the same problems, but in a slightly different way. It's a very different environment in the UK in terms of land ownership and farming. It's very intensive. There's lar large monocultures, big areas of land are owned by single people, and there's very few people in the landscape working in agriculture. So a man who owns 2,000 hectares might only have six people working for him, and he will do all that work with, uh, with machinery and with maybe some contractors. So it's a very different situation, but it's a very similar problem. The symptom in the UK is farmland biodiversity decline. So I'm showing you here two graphs, um, and the one on the left is about birds. So there's a lot of monitoring going on in the UK. If it's moving, somebody is probably monitoring it. And it's very true for things in um, nature. So let's look at birds. The red line is decline in bird species over the last 40 years or so. And the blue line shows you what's happened to the generalists, which, you know, they're going up and down. It's not, that's not where the decline is. The decline is in the specialists and the green line shows you farmland birds. So farmland birds have greatly suffered over the last 40 or so years. And the same is true for butterflies. Again, butterflies have been monitored. You can see there's fluctuations in that graph because butterflies are very sensitive to annual variations in temperature and climate. But in general, as a rule, the, de the trend is downward. And what's the problem? Well, the problem is, is that there's a lack of conservation at the landscape scale. Everybody focuses on their own farm and their own fields. And there's a, a huge lack of knowledge in the people's or in the farmer's hands. People don't know how to do it, even if they wanted to. And there's a lack of connection between farmers. The way that it's structured, these large farms with a few people focusing on this business model, trying to manage huge areas of land by themselves, mean that there is a lack of connection between the farmers in terms of how they work together, and then just in terms of isolation, and there's a lot of talk about the isolation of farmers in the UK, how bad that is for them socially and mentally as well. If we look at the system here, um, we can ask who owns it and who has power this problem. Well, the farmers own the land and they own quite a lot of it. And because it's such big tracts of land, the wider community who live in that landscape are also impacted by the decision of just a few people. And the scientists, they're always part of the story because they have, they can generate and share knowledge. And then the policy makers. So the policy makers here control legislation and subsidy, but they also have their obligation to the um, Convention on Biological Diversity and the SDGs. And in recent years, there's been, a, it's in, it, since the 1980s, there's been countryside stewardship schemes of one kind or another that have given subsidies to farmer to produce environmental goods and to manage their um, habitat. But these haven't reversed the declines in biodiversity. These are top down measures that were imposed on farmers and biodiversity in the landscape continues to fall. So one of the one of the possible approaches is to look for collaborative solutions. This top-down approach clearly hasn't worked. And so a new solution needs to be found. And one solution was proposed by the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, which was to encourage farmers to cluster together to manage their land for wildlife. So groups of farmers team up and they set their own targets for biodiversity. They're of course advised by other people, but they set their own targets and they learn together and they share experiences with the idea of meeting the national biodiversity targets for which they're there and they are then given subsidy. And what you can see on the map is it doesn't cover the UK by any means, but there are increasing numbers of these farmer clusters coming together to manage biodiversity. So here's the example, one example, and it just shows you how big these areas can be. 
So 43 farmers working together are managing 238 square kilometres of an area around a national, rate, um, national nature reserve. Um, so they are looking at site improvements and these farmers chose to um, focus on three, three particular species, turtle doves, grey partridge and hedgehogs. And so together they get together and look at how they're going to manage the land. So they look at putting connectivity into the landscape. They look at, so they might, if they were going to put in an area of scrubby habitat, they might make sure that it went in the right place, irrespective of whose farm it is on. And they will work together with their farm plans. And this is becoming quite successful, this um, approach. And I think it's something that we could think about in other environments as well and in, in other countries. One of the pleasures of these projects is people coming together to learn. And just to finish on an optimistic note, I'd like to share with you a three minute film that I hope it works. Um, hopefully it will, just a three minute film showing how this is playing out in the UK countryside. Uh, let me see. My name is Jessica yes. Brooks and I'm a Farmland Biodiversity Advisor uh, from the Game Wildlife yeah. Conservation Trust and I work with the Martin Down Farm Supercluster which is 43 farms on Cranbourne Chase um, to coordinate conservation activities for the farmers, provide advice and organise events. We held a farm insect walk um, co-hosted with Bug Life in aid of the national campaign Bees Needs Week. Um, with some funding from Natural England's uh, Landscape for Wild Pollinators Initiative. Every year we run a number of events um, to educate our farmers, local villagers, cluster volunteers, um, along with partnership staff in the Nature Reserve, uh, AONB and Natural England, um, about different wildlife, soil and water subjects. For me, it was rewarding to see it dawn on people how much life is out there and how reliant it is on our management. I was asked lots of um, really interesting questions which to me said that people were really thinking about it and that there's a real appetite to help our wild pollinators which is fantastic. We saw butterflies, moths, beetles, flies and bees um, so although it's Bees Needs Week um, I would say it's, it's a really good opportunity to open people's eyes to the wider pollinator community so uh, it's been a really good day, I've really enjoyed it. We particularly work with farmers um, and so being able to show farmers all the different types of pollinators that there are in the margins is absolutely invaluable. It was also really good to see so many little microhabitats around so that we could see where all sorts of different things could potentially be uh, because nothing was exactly the same. I came here to learn as much as I could but um, I certainly learned how much insect life there is in diverse strips around the woodlands and the grass fields um, and the arable fields. Um, you know, to see the amount of butterflies that we saw, um, which you always take for granted, um, to see the, the smaller flies and the, the bees that we saw was, was incredible. I think we need to be more in touch with what actually is out there on those margins um, and around the edges of the fields where, where mainly the, the the birds would nest and, and they would, would feed and to see what to actually see where all these chick this chick life is just to, to actually see what plants grow and what it likes and what you need to provide for these for these chicks it's nice to see even something i would think of as a weed like a creeping thistle is actually quite a valuable habitat this is just a spin for next time my grassland management is criticized but actually everything has a place you know ivy you know that weed we all love to hate actually has you know as we found out today has a has a good place in providing habitat and, and good food you know, for out of season. There is a lot more depth to it, you know, for small buzzy things that I would ignore or worry if they're going to eat my crops in the past. Now I actually have a place and have a role and, and I'm part of a bigger, bigger chain. You know, there's so much out there that's tiny and inconspicuous that you would just never even think about while you're walking by. And actually every tiny little thing in the countryside plays an integral part in the whole system. So um, I think people have gone away today with a real appreciation of, of um, all the small things. Okay, so in summary, I'd just like to say that, 
you know, sustainable development is a complex systems problem. Targets are set globally, but must be met locally. And the solutions are best run by the community along with experts. We need, you know, we must appreciate that biodiversity underpins sustainable development globally and locally, and that managing for biodiversity delivers more than just biodiversity, and it can have um, multiple sustainability outcomes. And I'd just like to say thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> Smith. Thank you very much for your nice, simple and uh, really mind blowing explanation. These things are really application based things and um, I'm really thankful to you. Just two or three questions which are very relevant to your topic. Uh, the first one is from Disha Roy, our student. That's why I am also entertaining the question. If we spray pesticides or insecticides before flowering of a plant, will that affect in the nectar composition and be toxic to the bees or other nectar foraging insects? Well, it depends what kind of pesticide it is and how long it lasts in the environment. So some pesticides will persist and still be there. You're saying before flowering, it really depends what kind of pesticide it is. I mean, if it's a not a very long lived pesticide, the answer is probably no. That doesn't mean it won't affect other insects, but it wouldn't affect the foraging bees. But if it's a long lasting one, then it could have an effect if it's systemic. So that depends. Okay, uh, one more question. May, may I go for one more question, ma'am? So another question is, what is the effect of overall global climatic change on this bee population? That is also from our uh, student. Overall? Yeah, that, yeah, I mean, that will have a big, big effect. I mean, it will, it, I would imagine that it will result in big rain shifts. So the populations of bees will move from one area to another. And in some areas, so two things will happen. There will either be a direct impact, um, meaning that the, it could be a direct impact on the, the bees, on the pollinators, in that they can't live in that new environment. Or it might be that their, their phenology is then put out of kilter with the plants who are all, which are also responding to climatic changes. So there can be breakdown in the ecological network or there could be direct death. And there will also be rain shifts as species move in response to changes in climate. Okay, and the last question is, uh, what are the economic risks associated with the decline in the pollinators? I mean, it's a huge risk. Obviously, a yeah, huge risk, uh, agricultural our risk. Food, it's our food system. If we, if we have not enough pollinators, we won't have enough food. It's that simple, really. Oh, we will have to change. So we will be eating a lot of wheat and rice <laughs> that doesn't rely on pollinators. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, the sustainability will be at stake. It's as simple as that. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. Now it's um, uh, my portion is over. Now it's to Tanvir we will conduct, who will conduct this last session of Thanksgiving and our ma'am is over here also. So we are also privileged. Uh, so it's over to Tanvir and principal ma'am. Uh, thank you, Papiyadi. Mm -hmm. Honorable Principal Dr. Ruma Bhattacharya, respected IQA coordinator Dr. Seta Guho, all internal and external IQ, IQAC and governing body members of Vijay Krishna Girls College, our most renowned invited speakers Dr. Pratap Kumar Padi, Dr. Konika Chatterjee, Dr. Barbara Smith, Dr. Ojita Rai Choudhury, and Dr. Monomita Maiti Nondi, our collaborator. Chairman of West Bengal Biodiversity Board, Dr. A.K. Sanyan, our special guest, Dr. Parthi Basu, the members of the organizing committee and all the respect participants. It is a great honor to have the opportunity to propose a vote of thanks to all who have helped us in making the first day of this webinar such a resounding success. First of all, I would like to express our 
gratitude to the first invited speaker, Professor Putap Kumar Padi, Department of Environmental Studies, Vishwabhauti, for his very lucid and informative lecture on role of biodiversity in human welfare and its sustainability aspects. I would like to thank our distinguished speaker, Dr. Konika Chatterjee, Professor and ex-head, Department of, Department of Commerce and former director, Interland Quality Assurance Sale, University of Calcutta for giving an excellent lecture on rethinking business education for a circular economy and making this webinar interesting and meaningful. I would like to express our profound gratitude to Dr. Barbara Smith, Associate Professor, Center for Agroecology, Water and Resilience, Coventry University, UK for her kind presence and her thought provocative lecture on how can we practically integrate biodiversity conservation into sustainable development lessons from agriculture ecology. I, I, I also wish to thank Dr. Parthivo Basu, Professor, Department of Geology, Director, Center for Agroecology and Pollination Studies, University of Calcutta for extending his generous support. I also thank Dr. A.K. Sarnayal, Chairman of West Bengal Biodiversity Board for his valuable time and help. I thank all the participants for making the first day of this webinar successful. I would also like to congratulate the conveners of this webinar, Dr. Papia Ghos and Dr. Bidadhar Mondon, Mondol and all the others member, members of this organizing committee, Dr. Amit Majumdar, Dr. Devjani Mitro, Dr. Sabroni Chatterji, Dr. Devlina Kumar, Pratap Mondol and Sobhik Das. I also wish to thank Dr. Seta Guho, IQSC coordinator of Vijay Krishna Girls College for providing much needed encouragement and support. Last but not the least, uh, I would like to express our sincere gratitude to our beloved principal of Vijay Krishna Girls College, Dr. Ruma Bhattacharya for unending motivation, encouragement and support throughout this journey. And this is the end of the first session of this webinar. Uh, then we, we, uh, we yes. yeah can i can i just oh, say a few words okay, can okay, i just okay. few words? Uh, our principal uh, map is there over yeah, to you ma'am yeah. so just 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 uh, expressing my heartfelt thank me, uh, thanks to all the speakers today and um, it was really uh, very much enlightening uh, i enjoyed listening a part of it i was listening on youtube also and um, uh, this is this is def definitely has been a very fruitful session today. And uh, thank you, Dr. Pathi. Thank you, Dr. Chatterjee. And thank you, Dr. Smith. All of you have done. Uh, I mean, you were wonderful. And I have seen the comments where the uh, participants were saying um, it's a really good session. It's a really good session. So I think uh, our objective of building up an awareness and spreading a knowledge has been very successful today. And I must thank Dr. Shannal, who has been with us throughout. And I hope he will be with us, with us again tomorrow. And I am hoping to listen to him tomorrow too. Thank you, everyone. Ma'am, excuse me, uh, ma'am, Parthibda is there. You can uh, oh, see. Oh, so okay, I, I would okay. like to introduce Parthibda. Parthibda is the collaborator of Dr. Yes, Smith. Yes, I would Willis. like to be introduced to him. Yeah. Yes, uh -huh. definitely. Yes, He's yes. the professor, Department of Zoology, and uh, renowned researchers in the field of this kind of agroecology, application-based ecology. Okay. Parthibda, uh, Mane, uh, I just uh, asked uh, him for the support, and in my one word, he just arranged everything. Uh, it, was my pleasure. it was my pleasure and thank That's, you very thank much. Thank you, Martin. That has a lot. I must say a few words here. I must say uh, one or two things here. This is what we want. This is what we want. Uh, the, the, you know, uh, if we together work, the colleges and the university department, then I think we can achieve a lot. And it, you have really uh, given us a big opportunity today to collaborate and to, you know, do this webinar. And Papia has been telling me how you have helped us. And we would like more of this kind of uh, collaboration and support from the, because Calcutta University is our affiliating university. 
we are we expect so much from the university and thank you for being there for us thank you always 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 madam thank you very much again and congratulations for hosting this seminar and it's it's a great uh, success as i can see as of today and i'm sure tomorrow's will also be very very good so yes, yes. yeah so ma'am ma congratulations ma'am we will be looking for a talk from parthivoda too in some in next uh, webinar regarding yeah, definite, this ecology definitely no, yeah, no that's what i said papia that's what i said we are looking forward to more collaborative activities between the university department at the university and the college departments we have i must uh, i don't know whether papia has informed you i must, i would like to inform uh, everyone present here today that we have set up a mentor mentee cell uh, where we have uh, three or four colleges papia yes, that yes. we are collaborating and we are trying to help the students at in this time of pandemic and lockdown this this is where we are trying to help because the students are our, are our most important focus so we are forming this kind of cells and we would be very grateful if the university also joins uh, join their hands with us we'll be very yeah. grateful in that I'm sure the university would be do, yeah, would definitely yes. love to do that and uh, in even in my individual capacity if i can be of any help please you know i mean yeah, so i would be really glad to uh, collaborate and uh, join hands basically work together thank you very much thank you thank you very much thank you papia bye bye thank you patip da thank you dr smith and thank you ma'am thank you shetadi and thank you all shobai shobai ke thanks mane not necessary because we are the organizing committee okay bye 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 thank you all Uh, there is a little bit announcement. We will to tomorrow. We will join. Tomorrow, same... tomorrow we will start at one thirty. Hopefully, I won't have any more technical glitches tomorrow. Uh, and and the same link will be uh, active. The same link which the candidates okay. need to just okay. log into the same link. And that, uh, it is a concurrent event in the webinar Zoom webinar. So no, the no need to go for a new fresh link, new link or fresh link. It will the old link will be uh, active. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Social. you very much. Okay. Thank you. It's Thank you, like. madam. for gracing the final portion in this way thanks a lot it makes a huge sense for the webinar also yeah. okay yeah of papia i was uh, at something else but i was looking at the youtube and sometimes yeah. listening also so it was very it was wonderful actually it was wonderful actually dr smith and parthip the oh, works together oh, in application based wonderful. manner application based to mane khub easy ar bujhte bhalo lage field please start on your video yes please please turn on your video papiya di